Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this is the April 29th, 2019 Town of Scarborough Planning Board. And I have everyone rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was probably the best Pledge of Allegiance I've heard in this room, so congratulations to everyone here. Second. <laughs> Second. Um, next, can we do the roll, please, Noreen? Nicholas McGee? Here. Rachel Hendrickson? Here. Roger Bealy? Here. Robin Saunders? Here. Richard Duperry? Here. Jennifer Ladd? Here. Rick Meinking? Here. Thank you. Uh, we have minutes for March 18th, April 8th. Uh, I'm not quite ready, so I will motion to table the April 8th minutes. I have a second on that? Second. Any discussion? All in favor of tabling the April minutes. Thank you. Uh, March 18th minutes. <clears throat> motion to approve. So moved. And a motion and a second. Any discussion? Changes? No? All in favor? So that unanimous. Thank you. And just a quick announcement for uh, our applicants here this evening. And um, we, we recently conducted a planning board workshop and Part of our discussion had to do with making um, us more efficient, uh, trying to help applicants out through this process. As you can see, some nights we get pretty full agendas. Um, so uh, staff, working with staff, uh, we've kind of redeveloped some of the staff comments and some of uh, our applicants might have noticed that what we really want to try to accomplish at these meetings um, is really to try to dive in and focus on the issues that we need to push one way or the other to help the applicant get to where they need to be or make sure that they are headed in the direction they need to be. So uh, with that in mind, you know, our, uh, our structure here tonight is going to be more about pushing the questions we really need to discuss forward. If you're an applicant and it's your first time presenting here and it's sketch plan, yeah, we want to hear what this plan is about. We want to hear a lot of those details. If you're here for the fourth or fifth time, you can kind of skip some of that mundane stuff and really kind of get to the, the heart of the issue um, of what we're trying to discuss. Uh, that will help us, it will help our agenda, it will help our applicants. Uh, we know time is money on uh, some of your expenses and we also do this at zero pay, so we'd like to go home and sleep at some point. <laughs> so, um, clearly there's gonna be a lot of public comment tonight, uh, just another general announcement on that. Gonna limit you to about four minutes, um, which is great. We wanna hear from you. Uh, if you can try to be succinct, um, at, to what your position is and why, we'd appreciate that. Um, and make sure that when you come up to the podium that you're clearly stating your name tonight, where you live, and uh, so Doreen can take good track of it. We do have a lot of uh, public comment already received via email and letters <coughs> written, and it's, it's wonderful and we appreciate it. So that said, uh, I think we should jump into the, uh, the heart of this meeting and we'll kick it off with Jay. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a public hearing on proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance, specifically Section 2I, Contract Zoning. Um, just by way of background, uh, the Ordinance Committee um, has been working with staff and has um, asked us to take a look at um, language in the zoning ordinance as relates to the review process for contract zones specifically. Um, and really think about some proposed amendments that seek to address when, primarily, when the public is engaged in the process, particularly when there's an amendment to an existing contract zone. Um, so there's an interest that was expressed by the Ordinance Committee um, based on some recent reviews. As this board knows, there's been a number of contract zones uh, and amendments in the last few years, and I think there's a feeling that um, we sort of have two separate processes, um, and just by quick way of background for a new application, the first step in the process is a joint meeting with the planning board and town council, and at that meeting, there's, uh, the abutters are notified by mailing and are provided an opportunity to speak at that, at that um, first, uh, first reading or first public hearing, I should say. Um, for an amendment, it's a little bit of a different process. The first application, or the first formal discussion is a first reading by the town council and there is an actual uh, direct notif uh, butter notification until um, the second sort of step in the process which is when the application gets to the planning board. 
Um, and so the thinking was how can we sort of reorganize the existing language, those two different processes, to really engage the public earlier and have a more fully vetted conversation at the outset uh, for amendments. Um, and so the language that's been prepared and uh, provided as part of your packet really seeks to bring those two in a line and it, it, it sort of uh, eliminates the existing language around modifications and embeds that into the existing language uh, for, new, um, for new contract zone applications. Modified or amended contract zones would follow that same pathway. Um, so I'm certainly happy to talk about the language um, in here, but I think as an overview that about sums it up. So there's an opportunity for public comment on this item. Uh, this, your comments will be shared with the council as they proceed uh, to consider new language changes here. Is there anyone that would like to discuss this topic in particular? While we wait for folks to approach the podium, I should mention that you uh, will have received, uh, I think we received one email on this, on this item that was provided to you all. Uh, so we did receive one piece of public comment. Seeing that, I'm going to close public comment and turn it over to anyone here on the board that wants to kind of discuss this. If there's anything they see here that jumps out at them, anything they'd like to change. Right. I, I simply would like to say that I, I think it's a very good idea that the public is involved earlier and the abutters have an opportunity. It's a start of the process rather than part way through. Thank you, Rachel. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to agree with that. I think the earlier we can engage the public, and also um, kind of that, that pre-vetting that can kind of happen uh, before a project really gets going is good. If you think about it in the terms of the way our process is currently structured, the applicant has already spent significant time and money and effort to bring it to the first hearing, and the public hasn't even seen it. So I think making this, this change will really kind of assist in, in all of that, and that way we don't have applicants um, wasting resources on a project that might not go anywhere. I mean, that's, that's only fair to them, and then as fair as the public is to have that first sight when, when uh, we find out, you find out. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good change. So, uh, yes, Roger. <laughs> Just for clarification, uh, as an example, okay, um, take the, um, the um, Land, Land Rover. That's a contract zone, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And they would be for us to just amend that zone. <coughs> you can't hear me? No. Okay. No. They were they were before us just to amend that to add that extra parking in the in the back. Now with that, it's my understanding reading this that they would not have to go through that first step, is that correct? Nope. So their first step in the process, any new contract zone amendment, existing contract zone amendment, the first step in the process okay. would be a joint hearing. Um, with this board and the council, and pu the public would be duly noticed. Um, yeah. Butters would be get direct mailing. So that would be the process for both new contract zones as well as any amendments to existing contract zones. Okay, I'm not sure I understood that the way I read that. But so they they would have to. Um, so that that one there, that example would be treated mm -hmm. like a brand new contract zone. In terms of process, correct. Okay, so just for in here, it says, um, I guess if we're dealing with a phased, if there was a contract zone and it was a phased development, mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't have to go through that first? That's correct. The contract zone provision actually spells out that projects can be phased, so they would have to go. Um, I, should, I would say at, at the outset of a project, it would have to spell out what the phases are. So the, the town council would ultimately approve in the contract zone what the full build, build out is, and in that contract zone could establish certain phases. Um, so that, that can occur as part of the process, but it would have to be spelled out in advance. So if they had, um, I think, you know, the Land Rover is a very good example where they came in for a parking lot that wasn't previously considered or discussed in their contract zone. That is always going to be an amendment to their, that contract zone. Okay, all right, okay. 
All set. Is there any other board discussion on this? Okay. I just uh, want to say that I yes. fully support it as well, and think that staff has done a great job to uh, review <coughs> this and, and push it forward. Thank you. Yeah, so there's no formal action we need to take tonight. This was a public hearing, um, and any comments that we have or from the public have been will be passed along by our Does Doreen. the memo not say that we have to provide a recommendation to town council or no? Yeah, so I think the board typically, as the minutes will reflect a Perfect. recommendation, and it may be nice to have a, a summary statement if the chair were so inclined. Sure. There were multiple nodding heads. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that the, this board uh, finds a, a positive, uh, would like to send a positive review of the current language in the amended ordinance. Sounds about right. And more nodding heads. <laughs> so that's unanimous nodding heads. Thank you. Well done. Right. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is the Scarborough Public Schools request an advisory opinion for 22 Muzzy Road. Assessor's map RO38, lot 034. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this project's located in the TVC zoning district at 22 Muzzy Road. Uh, so given that the school department is the applicant uh, before you right now, uh, the board is required to provide an advisory opinion um, on the proposal. As you may recall, the school department uh, was before the board in February for an advisory opinion review of the expanded parking area and a new portable, portable classroom building. Since February, the applicant has amended the plans and is now proposing two portable classroom buildings along the front side of the existing school building, and the proposed parking area remains the same. Uh, staff has provided several review comments for the board's consideration, but at this point, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jamel. And if we'd like to have the applicant, please introduce yourself and... Good evening. Good to be here. My name is Chris DiMatteo with Coral Palmer. I'm representing the public schools uh, tonight. Um, I think uh, perhaps most of you. Now we're in shape. Uh, most of you might remember that uh, last time I was here, maybe uh, I think it was February, and we were looking at um, this portion of the project here where we're. Uh, building a new parking lot, about 34 spaces, to help out with uh, the kind of issues uh, that are happening with um, drop-off and, and pick-up in the morning and provides more space for staff <coughs> and then allows more parking here for the drop-off and the pick-up. Um, at that time, we had uh, shown also, along with this parking, we showed a um, two-room portable classroom right in this area here attached to the existing portables that are there now, actually. Um, in the interim, though, since uh, that we su submitted that, um, with more information from uh, forecasting, the uh, public schools were interested in really actually getting uh, two or f a total of four classrooms, looking to put those temporary classrooms out front here. And so talking with staff, uh, it was uh, in the best interest of everyone to come back and uh, uh, get some input from you in terms of um, your um, understanding of, of our application, our site plan application, and, and get your feedback. Uh, we have staff comments, and we review those, and we appreciate those. I could go through those, if you like, uh, in terms of it's a short list. Uh, I, would, I would say if there's anything in staff comments that you don't agree with or don't think that you can bring to fruition, then we'd like to hear about the reasons why or no, I, I think we're all on board with those and we appreciate those and they all get uh, um, addressed during the process all right thank you very much uh, at this point um, we do have an opportunity for public comment is there anyone here that would like to speak on this issue seeing none, I'm going to close public comment uh, does anyone on the board have anything to offer on this from what they're seeing no? So we're, we're going to go ahead and say the advisory opinion is a positive one. Um, we did see this uh, recently, and it looks like there's not a, not a whole lot. Um, you agree with all staff comments as we wrapped up. Um, anything else that staff has to add to this? Okay. Thank right. you, and good luck to you. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Next 
It's actually a good time for me to mention that uh, with all of the applicants here tonight, if uh, you realize the new structure of the staff comments, there's some priority ones that we're going to discuss as a board. Below it are kind of some detail cleanup type of details. We, uh, we don't need to go through those. If you, uh, if you generally agree with staff comments in that section, then we're not going to uh, take it up. If you have an issue with anything listed in that staff comment section, we want to hear about it and why we would then take it up. Planning board members, of course, are always welcome to dive into that section if there's something they see that they don't like uh, in the staff comments. But otherwise, we're going we're gonna to view it as something that kind of universally cleaned up, accepted. All right. Uh, <coughs> next item tonight, um, Main Life Retirement Community, Inc., requests a preliminary subdivision and site plan review for 5 Dorado Drive, Assessor's Map, R91, Lot 1D. Jamal? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is a proposed contract zone amendment in the RF zoning district uh, off of Dorado Drive. The applicants in front of the board this evening for a preliminary site plan and subdivision review. So the applicants proposing a new senior living, ind senior independent living campus that includes 16 duplex units, a mixed use commons building consisting of 28 apartment units, and eight single family homes. The applicants also proposing a public access trailhead accessing a trail network interconnected with Camp Ketcha trails and a nine acre conservation uh, easement on the back portion of the property. The applicant was last before the board in November and was scheduled to be before the board again in January but decided to table their, their application. A site visit was held on April 26 with the applicant. Uh, at the visit, Rachel, Roger, and Jen were able to attend from the board as long as several members from the public. So this evening, the board really has two roles um, in their review. Uh, the first one being review the preliminary plans based on the site plan and subdivision standards and grant approval if comfortable. And two, provide advisory comments on the proposed contract, loan agree contract zone agreement language for the town council's consideration. So I'll dive in here. As requested by the board, the applicant did conduct a balloon test uh, to simulate the height of the proposed commons building uh, back in December of 2018. The applicant has provided photo simulations that include the view of the balloons um, from 11 different vantage points adjacent to the property. So the applicant should discuss this balloon test with the board this evening. Another request from the board was for the applicant to provide a crosswalk across Spur Rink Road to the existing Piper Shores property, as this would provide a connection from the site to the existing pedestrian system in the Higgins Beach neighborhood. The town's traffic consultant has noted that this crosswalk will require approval from the main DOT, and it may be hindered by their regulations due to the existing speed limit along this section of roadway. If main DOT does not approve the proposed crosswalk, an alternative approach should be considered. Uh, these are the main elements for the board to review this evening. Uh, there are a number of other remaining elements, as noted in staff's comments, that can be reviewed administratively if the board is comfortable with that approach. And finally, staff would like to note that we did receive several letters from the public uh, via email and hard copy, and these letters have been provided to you guys, the board, uh, for your consideration. That's all. Thanks, Jamal. I appreciate it. Um, the applicant would like to approach the podium and dive in. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jim Adamovich. I'm CEO of Maine Life Care Retirement Community. Uh, doing business as Piper Shores, we're pleased to provide an update in our presentation for the Town Planning Board meeting this evening. Um, as noted in the introductory comments, there have been a number of opportunities over 2018 and 2019 to present to both Town Council as well as the Planning Board and inclusive of a joint workshop that was held in early January 2019. As a result of all of these interactions, um, we have made a number of modifications to our application and wish to formally review those with the planning board this evening. Um, our presentation will include representation from Sebago uh, Technics, our civil engineering firm. They are represented by Will Conway this evening. Uh, as the project is noted as a contract zone amendment process, We'll also ask Charlie Katz-Levy, legal counsel with the firm of Jensen Baird, to highlight some of the CZA um, pertinent um, uh, points for discussion. Um, we believe that our application this evening is really the result of a considerable amount of input and cooperative effort from planning board, town council, as well as input from neighbors to the project. 
and we are um, excited to be able to provide an update to the planning board uh, this evening. So I'll turn the presentation over to Will Conway. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Will Conway, Sebago Technex Project Manager. Um, so behind you is the overall plan uh, for the project. Again, there's three neighborhoods, the pocket neighborhood here, the commons building here, and the estates here, all sort of uh, <clears throat> sited around a central uh, open meadow with a stormwater pond. Um, one of the things that's different with the project, that those units are 52 units. And, uh, and that is the cap for the project. So we're no longer asking for 61. And in addition to that, uh, we're proposing to place nine acres in the rear of the property in a permanent conservation easement. This is the uh, site entrance. This is Spurwink Road. This is the entrance to the existing Piper uh, Shores campus. This is the uh, entrance to the project here. And um, Jim Allen, his opening comments, mentioned um, at the board's request, we had uh, proposed a crosswalk uh, connecting the project uh, to the existing trails within Piper Shores. When we come back to you for final plan, we'll ship the location of that crossing to this location at the recommendation of the town's traffic consultant. This is the pocket neighborhood, and those members that attended the site walk could visualize. Uh, we're proposing a 10 to 12 foot uh, earthen berm along Newcomb Ridge Road and uh, planting it with uh, mature evergreen buffer. At staff request, another significant change we made to the plan, the new plan, is we're now continuing that buffer around this edge of the property and up all the way adjacent to the Commons building just outside of the existing tree line, which will be preserved within the 50-foot uh, buffer. Uh, the other thing that we've done is uh, we've formalized, both on the plan and in the contract zone, um, we're providing a 75-foot setback along uh, Newcomb Ridge Road. This is a representative cross-section uh, of the bermed area, this being Newcomb Ridge Road here, this being the pocket neighborhood, and the berms here with the evergreen plantings uh, on the berm. Uh, this is a central meadow here. Uh, it'll have a, a stormwater pond with a permanent pool elevation. And the other thing of note in this slide, you can see the continuation of the planted buffer. The round symbols are existing trees to remain. And then we're augmenting that with evergreens in this area here. And this is the Commons building. Again, it shows that buffer continuing all the way to this property corner, extending around the corner of this entire area. Uh, shows the front of the building here with uh, resident and guest parking front entrance being here, and then entrance to the garage below at either end of the building. This is the previous design. The other <coughs> change we've made to the project is we've lowered the height of the hybrid, the common buildings, from 55 feet, as shown in these first few slides, to 40 feet uh, by eliminating the pitch roof. And some we've maintained a pitch roof in the center, but on the ends we've lowered the building by 15 feet uh, to again uh, soften the views from abutting properties. And then this is the estates neighborhood here, eight uh, single family buildings. They're also oriented with uh, pockets um, in this area with vehicle circulation on the exterior. And then this is the uh, public uh, parking and trailhead access. This plan uh, shows the lighting distribution. The yellow areas are the areas that would be lit. So it's basically roadways and unit 
uh, access points. And one thing to note is that the point where the, it reaches zero foot candles is well within the property lines. We've also agreed to dim the lights at 11 p.m. Uh, we did the balloon launch the day after Christmas. Uh, Jamel mentioned it. Um, we, um, we launched three balloons two at this corner, two at this end of the hybrid, one here. And then we took 11 pictures from Newcomb Ridge Road, Spurwink Road, and Acorn Lane. And there's only two places where the balloons were visible. One was right here to this balloon at the end of Newcomb Ridge, and one here to this uh, balloon here. And as I pointed out earlier, both of those views would be mitigated by the berming and evergreen plantings that we propose. And I'd like to have Charlie come up and talk about the contract zone amendment. But I will be back. Good evening, Charlie Katzlevy, uh, legal counsel to Piper Shores. And I'll just run through this very quickly. I uh, wanted to highlight some of the changes that we've made in the contract zone uh, document. So as Will mentioned, we are down to a hard cap of 52 units. The building height has been decreased by 15 feet. Uh, we have added uh, the 75 foot setback from Newcomb Ridge, and in addition to that, some additional buffering and screening. Um, and they, uh, in response to many comments we received uh, from this board and, and from others, uh, the nine acre trail network in the back is now being offered for donation uh, to conservation easement. Um, although uh, public benefits is more in the range of the council, we just thought we'd highlight them uh, because the contract zone now goes through uh, the benefits of the contract zone as well as uh, consistency with the comp plan, and that's Exhibit C. Uh, <coughs> Exhibit C, excuse me. Um, the additional senior housing for the town, uh, the innovative design, uh, and the cluster development with open space, uh, which ties into number three. Uh, additional conservation land and open space. Uh, recreational trails, and, and sometimes this gets lost a little bit in the discussion. I know the trails are currently used, but there is no public right at this time, um, and the, uh, the applicant does intend to make this property available to the public. Um, pedestrian connectivity, uh, we've talked about that in a, no a number of different formats, uh, be it um, contributions financially connecting to the existing campus, uh, the trail network and, and so forth. Uh, public parking, they've now, uh, the applicant has upped that to seven parking spaces for the public. Uh, we've discussed the enhanced setbacks, including the 75 foot setback from Newcomb Ridge, uh, the additional screening, um, the uh, contribution to the affordable housing fund has increased significantly. I believe it's uh, more than doubled um, to 250,000. And then in addition, uh, the contract zone calls for all of the units to be uh, fully taxable, um, and uh, I think the impact on town resources such as the schools is understood. This uh, is a nice representation of the parking area, the existing trails, the conservation easement area, and in response to one uh, concern from the public, um, the contract zone provides that uh, we will maintain, the applicant will maintain public access on the trail shown on the subdivision plan, so there will be connectivity from the parking area to the conservation easement area. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Will. Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> and bear with us, we're almost through. Um, so we've been at this for quite a while. This is our fourth time before this board. Uh, we currently have approvals from the Sanitary Sewer District, the Portland Water District. We have our main DEP permit. We have our Army Corps permit. Uh, we've demonstrated in, through our submissions, uh, specifically in your packet, uh, how we comply with your subdivision standards. Your peer review, stormwater and traffic engineers 
uh, have agreed with our uh, technical data. And we need one more approval, and that's your preliminary plan approval, which we're requesting this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, so with the applicant done with their presentation, we do have an opportunity for public comment this evening. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to cap it at four minutes per speaker. I will give you a little courtesy tap when you get about 30 seconds left. Um, but I am going to stick to the hard four minutes just based on the number of smiling faces I see here this evening. So if you would like to approach the podium, please state your name and your address. Welcome. This is surprising. Good evening. Uh, my name is Art Dillon. I am. I live on Black Point Road. I'm also the president of the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've submitted a letter. I hope it all got to you, but I'd just like to go on record. Um, as a community of business owners, operators, the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce sees enormous financial and social value in Piper Shore's proposed expansion at Dorado Drive. Piper Shores already demonstrate, has demonstrated it is not only a good neighbor, but it's also generous, thoughtful, reliable, and a responsible neighbor in its 18-year operating history. While mo most uh, nonprofit businesses are exempt from property taxes, Piper Shores agreed on day one to pay taxes for its independent living residents. As a result, they have become the largest single taxpayer in the town of Scarborough, contributing almost $1.5 million annually to the town. This enormous, the enormous benefits of working and living in Scarborough have not been lost on the Piper Shores community. The nonprofit entity and its residents are well known for its generosity of time, talent, and um, wealth toward many uh, worthy causes in our town. Uh, including the Scarborough Land Trust, Public Library, Project Grace, the School Department, the Safety uh, Departments, uh, Operation Hope, and many others. With the new project, we can expect approximately 85 residents becoming active citizens here in Scarborough, volunteering, donating, and working and buying goods and services in our community. We believe that these new residents will also be thoughtful neighbors. Piper Shores is a known entity with the highest reputation, not just in Scarborough, but the state and our region, in quality, quantity, and being great community members. They have agreed to preserve land, provide public parking to access trails, contribute to the town's affordable housing program, contribute funds to sidewalk installation, and additional buffers and berms and mature trees. Being the oldest state in the country, there's a huge need for senior life care communities in our state. And there's room for, for this addition, which also adds value to our town. As members of the business community, we do not and must not underestimate the value of their presence that brings to our town. It is for these reasons stated, uh, we enthusiastically and strongly support the Piper Shores expansion at Dorado Drive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, I'm Jeff Jones at 14 Acorn Lane. I'm a direct butter to this project. Um, this is an amendment um, to I think the third one possibly to the original Piper Shores contract zone and uh, the first issue is the traffic issue and there's been substantial increase in traffic on Sprowink Road since the first Piper Shores and now this is now this is the second amendment at least and there's been no real traffic study done to find out what's the real impact on Sprowink Road caused by uh, what we are trying to amend now which was the first contract zone they estimated 200 cars per peak hour back then, but do we really know that that's correct? And now they've expanded one time on their campus, added more housing, and now they're expanding 52 units on the other side of the road. And as we sit here today, no one can tell you, because there's been no studies done, what's the real impact of not only what's been done, but what's going to be happen, what they're proposing. 
And again, for the last 20 years, there's been no changes to Spurwink Road. So there's been no improvements to the infrastructure, but yet the town has added Piper Shores. We've added additional parking at Higgins Beach. We have year-round surfing now. We have all this impact that's gone on on Spurwink Road, and there's been no changes to this. And so someone really needs to take a real look at that. And I believe the sidewalks, just for the applicant along 77, should be a, at a minimum what should be required. There should be no reason for the Scarborough taxpayers to pay for sidewalks for this applicant. It's a $43 million project, and sidewalks will cost $25,000 for them to put in. The town maybe can work with feasibility studies and try to start to connect this neighborhood, which is what the comprehensive plan wants us to do, with Higgins Beach and the surrounding neighbors. But if not, this is another isolated community. There's 52 units, and there's one road in, and it's a private road, and one road out. And there's no, there's no, no one, everyone's going to drive by it, but no one's going to go up there. So, um, and, and it's going to be the best kept secret in town that there's seven parking spots for the public at the end of this road. So I really think that the town has to take a look at that, both the traffic impact and, the, and requiring at least this applicant to put in sidewalks along 77 where people are going to walk to the, the Higgins Beach market, to, down, to the Higgin, down to Higgins Beach itself. Um, and that will connect Higgins Beach people. Why would they take their car to go park at the seven, seven uh, parking spots if you live in Higgins Beach? You're going you're gonna to want to walk or take your bike there. So it's going to be dangerous, too dangerous to do that, the way 77 is right now. And so we believe, let's be frank, that crosswalk across Spurwick Road at the at Dorado entrance is not going to happen. The main DOT is not going to allow that. The speed limit's too much too high there, it's not going to be allowed. So how are people going to safely cross? They're, they're not going to be able to. We all know that it's, that's a dangerous road um, and it's very busy, especially in the summertime. The conservation easement, that's a great improvement to this plan. We've been asking for that for the last eight months and I'm, I'm glad to see that we finally see a change in the plan. We are concerned that it doesn't abut, the conservation easement doesn't abut the public parking area. So I don't know why that's all wetlands, those last two acres. So if there's no plans for them to ever use that, I don't know why the wetlands wasn't put into the conservation easement so that when someone's getting out of their car and, going, and accessing the trails and walking their dog, they're not trespassing on, on other lands that not, that they're, that, that's not on the trail itself. So um, I'm concerned about the fact that there's, I'm at four minutes already? Well, that's the fastest four minutes of my life. Um, I am concerned about that not being in part of the conservation easement, that they have to actually cross the land of the applicant to get to the conservation easement. And the last thing would be the size of the building, the apartment building. It, they finally put it on the plan that's 94,000 square feet. Just to give you a scope of, of the scale of that, <coughs> all the other buildings that they're proposing only total 64,000 square feet. So it's... This is a huge building. It's, it's 10 times bigger than the Higgins Beach Inn. It's two and a half times bigger than the Comfort Inn down on Route 1. And it's too big for this in a RF zone. It's not compatible with the neighborhood. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lucia DeMarco Jones. I'm a resident of 14 Acorn Lane and a direct abutter to this project. Just want to say thank you for the opportunity to come forward. We've been involved in this since June of 2018, and I appreciate Piper Shore's efforts to keep us informed. And I know that this is a difficult job for you all, but I think it's also difficult to recognize that as residents to follow this whole contract zone amendment process and to understand the steps that are involved and the direct impact to the abutter is difficult to follow. So the residents of Acorn Lane have been trying to stay involved and stay in communication with you all, but I do think that it's important to point out a couple of things tonight. Um, <clears throat> there are things that are going right in Scarborough. I will give it that. And a lot of these things are a positive. But in this situation, I do feel that this RF contract zone is a change from having 18 or 20 houses in that parcel of land versus this project. And I, when I look at the uh, advantages that they pointed out earlier in today's presentation, very formal presentation about what are the, are the positives, the same positives could be said for having 18 houses there. 
um, you know, all of the same things. They could have public ac access to lands and trails and there could be conservation and there could be sidewalks and things like that. But this is just too big of a change. And I do think that this type of change really sets a precedent in this town. When Piper Shores first came to us 18 years ago, as you know, it was a very difficult and challenging process to get the project approved. Why? Because it was a slam dunk from the beginning versus the average person at Higgins Beach trying to get an amendment to the contract zone to put on a garage had to hire legal representation. So there needs to be a balance. The average person and taxpayer in, Port, in, in Scarborough has a hard time trying to just keep up with what's going on in the town and the responsibilities are yours as elected officials to represent us. And I would say that the key component of this project and the reason why I've, I've stayed involved along the way for me is just the size of the apartment building. The, those 28 un units and the, that community center is just so huge. I mean, it, the square footage of that building in and of itself is the sticking point, I feel. They've done a great job in terms of trying to make amendments, but here we are 10 months later. It's still a sticking point. People are not on board with that. The abutters are going to have to face looking at a building either in front of them that's that large or in their backyard. And to me, I would, I would pose to you as a council member, as a, a planning board member, would you want that to happen to you in your neighborhood? If you bought into a neighborhood, would you want that size building going in front of you or going behind you without much say? Because what we've been doing is just trying to talk to you, meet with them. The only other recourse we have is either to come to these meetings, email you, get legal representation, or to not vote for the next person if, if you don't if you vote this project in. And I just think that there needs to be a balance. And I know that there's problems that everyone's trying to solve for. The person is trying to sell a parcel of land for benefit and as to a developer. Piper Shores has a three-year waiting list. But we as the butters, what what recourse do we have? If this project goes in, we'll be looking at a four-story building for the rest of our lives and the and the property values will be decreased, I think, as an as a as a result, no matter how much buffering or landscaping they're going to do versus you know, just asking yourselves a key question. Do we need this project? There could be 18 houses going into that same parcel of land. You know, There could be just as many volunteers, people contributing to, to the community, just like Piper Shores. And I would ask you, that is the key question. It's a very large building, um, and I think it's gonna definitely disrupt our neighborhood even more. It will impact our, our property values. The traffic will definitely be increased, um, and I, I really do want you to take a hard look at, you know, do we need this project in comparison to 18 houses that could go in? That is the key item I would say for you to consider as elected officials. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak? Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Donald Simino. My wife and I live on Fort Newcomb Ridge, directly abutting the proposed Piper Shores expansion. First of all, let me state, we never knew anything about this project until after it was kind of given the green light. We never heard about it. It would seem we, <laughs> well after this was given the green, it would seem me the answers Newcomb Ridge had been allowed to speak in the beginning, the end result would probably be a lot different than it is right now. We're never allowed to speak. We didn't even know about it. Um, almost like we had deliberately left out of the loop. I mean, I don't, it doesn't feel good to me. Uh, we found out after the process was underway, I can imagine why anybody would think this project is a good fit for Scarborough. I can't imagine. Now, it far exceeds density in the RF2 zone. The current zone is the reason we live here, and we thought we would be protected against this sort of project. Um, seems like the town is welcoming Piper Shores and their totally out of place project over the local neighbors in the RF2 zone. Now, I've been in the construction business my entire adult life, and the information we have been given is limited. 
it appears to me that some of the information is somewhat misleading and presented in a way they want us to hear it for their benefit. Um, hard to imagine, we walked out around out there the other day, hard to imagine 20 foot tall block plus buildings when you're seeing two and a half foot grade stakes on the ground. And that the slope of the ground, say they're gonna knock down a little bit over here and bring this up a little bit over there. That's not, I can't see how it could possibly be happening. They've gotta bulldoze everything and it's gotta be a level area to build these buildings. <clears throat> it, it, it shows no, um, nobody's gonna build on the side of a hill. So, hard to match, okay, so let's go on. Yeah, they'll totally change, transform the to topography of this area and a tremendous amount of ledge there as well. So we're looking at it, uh, the ledge is on the surface, so it'll be a pile of blast, and we know that. I built the house that's next door to me, and I had to blast to get the foundation in there. So everything will need to be blasted. If they're not putting an individual house, it can be nestled into a pocket somewhere. They're building a big, huge complex that needs to, to go. And as far as the pocket neighborhood, we keep hearing them say, well, this has never been done in Maine before. Probably a good reason for that. Nobody wants it in Maine. Maine's rural. I mean, this, and this zone is rural, and I think it should be left rural. It just doesn't fit. Um, we, we, moved, we stay here because we thought we were protected in the RF2 zone. We thought we could have that zone and only see people on two acre lots. And uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the way it's gonna be if they do this project. And just a berm, that, that's great. They just wanna hide the project. So they, they, they know it's, it's not a good project for this area, so let's hide it. Let's put it behind a, a screen. Nobody will even know it's there. Awesome. So in the the low income housing fee, was that a one shot deal? I mean, does that, that happen every year? Or is that a one shot deal? And $25,000 for sidewalks. Um, I build a lot of things, and I know $25,000 might get you some planning and some road signs, some construction signs, but after that, who's footing the bill for the rest of the project? Will that be the town of Scarborough? I'm part of that town, and I don't want to foot the bill for that project. So. Uh, I guess that's just about all I have to say. Thanks for listening, so. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this? There's also anyone else that might think they want to speak. If you could just kind of queue up over there, that'd be great. Good evening. My name's Bob Dulac. I live on 6 Newcomb Ridge. I'm in a butter as well. Um, thank you for listening to us. We appreciate. Um, and we respect everyone's comments and, and, and thoughts. Um, with that said, I'm extremely and we are extremely surprised and disappointed that this proposal was before the planning board rather than the town council. It was my understanding there were many remaining issues. The town council had articulated on the February 6th workshop and therefore <coughs> February 6 workshop and therefore final approval of the contract zone was unclear. It made sense to pause the planning board review process until there were more clarity regarding the ultimate approval by the town council. My question is, has the town council sort of lot sorted out the issues, the many issues and concerns that came about in the February meeting? I heard some of them have been addressed, but there's quite a few that I recall that have not. With all the clear opposition from Newcomb Ridge, residents of Acorn Lane, Stonewich Drive, as well as some rightfully concerned residents of Piper Shores, it's difficult to understand why this proposal continues. As residents of Scarborough, our voices do matter. It seems to the most, it seems to me the most two important aspects, the comprehensive plan and the compatibility of, this, of the existing zoning districts have, districts have been forgotten altogether in this discussion. We are certain that the Piper Shores project is not consistent with the Town of Scarborough's comprehensive plan and is not compatible with the existing and permitted uses of the RF zoning clarificate, district clarifications. These are requirements are necessary before this contract zone, whether new or amended, can be approved. Any discussion suggesting otherwise is simply not valid. There has been no realistic conversation how those requirements have been met. We ask again, what good are zoning ordinance and town comprehensive plan if they are overlooked and ignored? 
the so-called benefit that the town that we saw this evening <coughs> aspect of the conversation <coughs> should not have been engaged in. If the requirements needed for the contract zone are not met, then no discussion about town benefits are appropriate. Trying to bridge the gap and create justified create excuses to justify the proposed project for low impact tax dollars or money spent by Piper Shores is wrong. The flawed process is what got us here today and it is <coughs> and it has been sent by town councilors that if they had been aware of the opposition on, on the June 20th, 2018 first reading to the town council, the project would have paused right at that point. We do recognize and appreciate the changes are being made moving forward to correct the flawed process that allow no voice that allowed us no voice from the beginning. Unfortunately, it appears that will not help our opposition of this project moving forward today. Looking at all other contract zone, existing contract zones, it is clear that the Piper Shores original and now contract zone amendment is likely, is, is like fitting a square peg into a round hole. The pieces simply do not fit. All other contract zone zones were, <clears throat> in this town required a tweak here or there. In, in all, in lo all other locations are consistent, incompatible with a comprehensive plan, in existing permitted uses with the zoning district clarification. The proposed Acura dealership is a prime example as to what a contract zone should be. The Piper Shores is a puzzle piece that does not fit on Dorado Drive. As residents of Scarborough, we again ask, to deny the, ask you to deny the Piper Shores unequivocally and adhere to the requirements of the current RF zoning ordinance and stay the town's comprehensive course of the town's comprehensive plan. We thank you for your consideration. Any other public comments? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comments. Um, <clears throat> so I, I just kind of want to quickly, uh, I'll go over a couple of things. There were some really good comments in there, um, food for thought, uh, and definitely um, I want to clarify a couple things. Uh, technically, we are not elected. If somebody was thinking we were elected. We, uh, we were appointed by the town council to make sure that the projects that come before us um, technically align with our, uh, our site plan provisions, our subdivision ordinances, things like that. Um, that's what we're really here to do. Uh, the other thing um, I do want to point out, somebody had mentioned that this was a done deal from the beginning. I think um, any applicant can come forward and propose anything on any parcel here in Scarborough. And whether it gets approved or not, it still deserves the right to go through the process. Nothing's a done deal, and I, I want to make that very clear. The applicant is doing um, what they're supposed to do. They had a thought, they put it on paper, and they started the process according to the ordinances we have in place. So uh, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that there was uh, some, some predetermined outcome for all of this. And even at the end of tonight's meeting, there is no predetermined outcome because what we do here tonight, and the one thing that we want to do here tonight is make sure that the technical aspects of what we're seeing here in the site plan uh, align well with what it is that we're asked to review for the ordinances. Um, when it comes to questions such as compatibility with the comp plan, um, that is what your elected officials gets to discuss at the town council level. And that's really where um, a determination about whether the contract, um, the amendment, the language used in it, all of that comes to a real head, to a real vote, whether it gets any type of approval. We're here to make sure that what the uh, council gets to see next aligns with the, um, the setbacks, the drawings, the, the more technical aspect of this. So I just wanted to kind of lay this out for you. Um, there's still other steps in this process as they go through it. Tonight doesn't determine anything uh, in finale either way. So just wanted to be clear about that. Um, that said, I do want to um, ask this board, we really have two big items tonight that we need to kind of chew on. Um, and I'd like us to take up one item at a time so the applicant, the public, everyone has a chance to hear where we fall on said first item, and then we'll move on to said second item. And then if there's anything else after that second item, I'll open it up to the board for any further discussion. Um, but the first thing that we want to uh, discuss here tonight is the technical aspects of this plan, uh, whether it's you're worried about a setback or something like that. So that said, um, Remaining, you know, limiting our comments that the second, just so everyone here knows, the second thing we'll be talking about 
is our recommendation on the contract zone language that we're seeing here presented to us. We have a chance to um, offer some suggestions for language changes or ideas that should be included in any contract uh, zone amendment that the council will be discussing. So that will be the second big topic we got to tackle. Um, thirdly is, I'll, I'll kind of just open it up to the board for anything else that they want to. So let's start with the technical aspects of what's before us tonight. Roger, sure. you want to start us off? Sure. Um, uh, first of all, I um, had a good site walk the other day, um, and I was very pleased when Will indicated that you're going to extend the um, buffering, and I believe it's to the west of the commons, right? You had, I think, it's going to be over here, okay? And that's basically going to be, because when we were on that site walk, and we took, a, you know, we we're standing up <coughs> by the commons. Right there. When we we're standing, um, and I think North is, if I'm not mistaken, heading this way, like this, right? Yeah. Okay. So when we were up there the other day, that was basically just trees there, and, and there was no plans for buffering at that point when we were doing the sidewalk. But you've extended that all the way over to that, that corner. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm pleased to see that. Um, <coughs> the other, I, I think the other big issue is the, um, is the whole issue with the sidewalk and everything. And if I could ask the town engineer a question. Sure. All right. Um, that's a state road. Yes. I don't recall. It might have been resurfaced by the town many years ago. I'm not sure. But in terms of actually doing any major construction on that road, I don't think there's been any major work done on that road for a long time, has it? Yeah, c correct. Um, I think we pave it. It's, it's typically a collaboration between PACs, DOT, and town might have a match because it is, it, it is a state road. So that's typically how that works. Yeah. Yep. Is, isn't it also one of the roads that, that has um, been targeted as, as a, like not up to what the standards that it has to be or something? Right. There's certain, yeah, federal or state standards, and it's just about... Um, more about deficiencies, like um, as far as road widths or shoulders or things like that, um, because of some of the obstructions out there, talking about like ledge and some of the large trees, things like that. It doesn't technically meet, yes, the federal standard for highway standard. Oh, okay, so if um, so, they still have to get a DOT approval to put a crosswalk right across that road. Correct. Which. Do you have any idea of the likelihood of that occurring? Um, well, I could say I. Have you seats for anybody? Hmm? <laughs> Maybe I can hear now. Sorry. <laughs> um, it has happened on other roads that were higher speed, I will say, but um, typically what comes with it is traffic calming that has to be done ahead of that because it's, it's really based on what the. 85th percentile, like how fast most people are going. So if you start bringing down that speed, then you can start bringing, you can do things like that with pedestrian amenities and crossings. Typically you have to do that ahead of it though. So I'm thinking of like near UNE, things like that, where they did a lot of traffic calming measures in order to get that crossing because they were able to lower the speed limit through there. But there's, there's work that needs to happen. So through I, I, I'm trying to figure out what is the likelihood that there's ever going to be a sidewalk there. Well, a sidewalk's different than a crosswalk. I well, thought you were talking about a crosswalk. Well, yeah, I'm talking about a crosswalk, but a crosswalk yep. has to go someplace. I mean, you cross the street, and yep. then you're just walking on the other side of the street. Well, that's two different things, though. So to get the crosswalk, like, that's when you're talking about the speed limit. To do a sidewalk, it's really about um, you can get... Um, um, you can go in front of the DOT and saying, here's, here's the issues we have, and you can get, um, I'm blanking on the term, which Jen's going to kick me for probably, but you can, you can, you can show a design and, and show why you're doing things a little different than the standard, um, and you can get that through 
um, a different review process for DOT. So the sidewalk is a different thing. Yeah, and I'm just going to jump in just to be clear that with the crosswalk that they're proposing at this point, if that's able to go forward, there, that would connect to, um, and Will, these are your plans, so forgive me if I go astray, but to a trail that sort of goes onto their property, sort of an off an off-road trail, if you will, connecting with the existing public trails on the existing Piper Shores property. Um, so it wouldn't be, their proposal at this point doesn't have a, a sidewalk per se that's directly in the right-of-way. Again, it connects to the public trails that goes through the Piper Shores existing campus and connects through to, I believe, Greenwood, um, and that would then connect to the pedestrian, the public, um, the, the more traditional sidewalk within the right-of-way in the Higgins Beach neighborhood. Well, they're talking about moving the sidewalk, I mean the crosswalk to the end of uh, Dorado, mm -hmm. okay? Now right across the street from there, I believe it's private homes. Is it, That's not owned by, it's owned by you folks? Yes. So what it would, what it would look like <laughs> uh, it would come down here, and then it would go up in this way, and then there's a paved sidewalk that goes down. Right. Then there's all the trails that go over to Higgins Beach. So, so Main Life owns that property right across the street? Yes. Oh, okay. I, yeah, uh, okay. we own all of this. Okay. So, uh, then uh, going back to the crosswalk again, we're, we're talking about something similar to what's at the market right now on 77. Wouldn't we? About putting something like that? Uh, aren't, there, aren't there the pedestrian signals there? There is a flashing beacon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'd, be t we'd like likely be talking about something similar to that if... Uh, right, but like I'm saying is they probably would have to do additional measures in order to get that speed limit down because uh, that's where, where the point was is that because of the high speeds through there. Okay. Then just... Um, so basically putting the crosswalk at the end of Dorado and going from one piece of their property onto the other piece, we're not really solving what some of the abutters have been talking about, the basically the sidewalk situation. We're just alleviating or making it easy for people who live on one part of this property to go across the street to the other part of the other piece of property. Um, <coughs> So <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I can understand that. I've never felt from the very beginning that, and I haven't heard anybody, I haven't seen any uh, correspondence or anything from any people who live at Piper Shores that they're keen on walking, you know, doing all this walking all over the place. Maybe, maybe they do or not, but I haven't, I haven't heard any of them talk about that. So um, that... I, I guess I'm all set at this. You know, I've, I've, I've exhausted this, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Yes. Could I just comment on Roger's? So that crossing was not part of our, our original plan. It was a concession that we made at this board's request. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, put that on the record. As we put it on there because you folks asked us to do that. Mm -hmm. And the connectivity... Um, you know, there's sort of four ways we're contributing to pedestrian access. Is the trail access in perpetuity to Camp Ketcha in the Libby River Preserve, the extensive pedestrian network on the parcel itself, the connectivity to the existing Piper Shores and Higgins Beach, and the sidewalk contribution, which is based on a standard town policy of measuring the linear footage of the frontage in measuring time and then multiplying times $25. So that's how we got the $25,000 we're proposing to contribute is actually a little bit more than the average contribution. So I just want that to be. Thank you. Explained. Thank you. Robin, do you want to? No, regarding um, connectivity, I heard you say that the trails. Sorry, we have new microphones. Um, 
so I heard some talk about trail <clears throat> connectivity. Um, the trails will connect to Camp Ketcha in one area, and the trails will connect to Higgins Beach in another. At some point, can you walk from, Higgin, from Camp Ketcha down to Higgins Beach? You could. So, and it's only because of this project that's willing to do what it's proposing. And so this is a good slide to demonstrate it with. So it would be possible, whoops, <laughs> I'll learn. Uh, starting at Higgins Beach, which which is somewhere off the map. You'd come up this path, uh, cross here, and then you'd use the sidewalk network. You could either go this way or you could cross the meadow. There's a trail there, which is shown on the subdivision plan, which will be granted or perpetual public access to the trailhead and then into this section and then into Camp Ketcha and to Libby. Libby River. So that would be accessible to the public. That's a huge benefit that we're providing. Can I continue, Mr. Chair? Okay. Um, has there been any, let me, I guess, I'm not sure if I want to ask staff or the applicant first, but it seems like there may be a tremendous missed opportunity here if DOT hasn't been in consultation with any of what's happening here too. Let me let me start here then, Will. Can you tell us when the last traffic study was done for this area? Um, well, I can only tell you what we did as part of our project. Yes, thank you. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was it was recent. We we did it in our original submission. Um, in what year? 2018. Okay. Late and 2018. Was it a full traffic impact study or was it? No, it was not a movement permit because the okay. trip generation is so low. And right, then the traffic movement permit is triggered when something goes over how many tri trips? 100 trips. 100 trips a day. We were well, I, I don't have the study with me, but we were well below that. This is a very low traffic generator. Um, this addition, but I think what this what citizens are saying is everything in aggregate, wondering if the trips will then trigger the traffic movement. Um, and by not sort of reaching out to DOT now, um, knowing that there's FHWA obstructions, that there might be sight line obstructions, um, opportunity for um, easements and sidewalks. Um, I just wonder if we're not missing the boat by involving DOT in the project and not capturing the true, and I, I don't mean by saying you haven't captured the true traffic impact, but the aggregate impacts. Um, so, and knowing that this is a, 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 a the added complexity of it being in the, the DOT compact zone and how projects get teed up through that. And I know others on this board and the staff can probably talk to this a little more that it's very complex how you navigate your timing on the list of when you get money kind of a thing. But if we're missing that opportunity to get state money combined with the private money for the needed improvements in that area. Um. Well, I can only say respective in terms of involving MDOT as it relates to lowering the speed limit and allowing the crossing. It's my understanding from Tom Hall that the town will initiate that request. And I, I don't know this, I can't speak for Tom, but I have a feeling that he hasn't done that because yeah, I'm not really speaking no preliminary plan approved. So sure, and I'm not speaking necessarily to the lowering of the speed limit. I'm talking about the aggregate traffic impacts. Yeah. So I think I think there's a couple different triggers that could potentially happen there, but um, I think it could be valid that you know I'm I'm wondering about the traffic impacts and wondering if others on the board might have a concern with that. Well, it's just, I, I just offered, um, as 
board members will recall that Bill Bray has done, I think, a, two, provided two series of peer reviews for the project. Mm -hmm. um, and so you should presume, I presume you have those in your in your packet or in the Dropbox. So I just want to remind the board that at least that level of review has occurred. But, but has he was, done it in aggregate, it, though, it Jay? Went, but as I was about to say, it was really focused on, on this mm -hmm. phase of the project. Correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and which brings me to my next point, and I don't mean to jump the gun, is how we're understanding if this is, if we want to do it as a contract zone amendment, then let's do it as a contract zone amendment instead of a new contract zone. So that means it's looking at everything in aggregate, including traffic impacts, including the contract zone language. If you want to pick up from the con the previous contract zone language and move forward, let's pick up from the traffic impacts and move forward, just like, you know, wetlands impacts and move forward. Yeah, so this is a contract zone amendment. No, I'm completely aware that it's amendment, but I remember us uh, talking previously about who decided it was amendment and not a new contract zone because it's across the street. So did that, so can this, anybody weigh yeah, in on that? And I'll I know end. that it's not ours, yeah. but I'm just making the analogy. It was reviewed by staff, um, the attorney for the town, okay. and they did believe that the amendment process was appropriate. In this okay, situation. then if it's an amendment, I think we should look at aggregate in consistently throughout the, the, the project, I guess. That's how I would want to do things. Um, but regarding the crosswalk, I, I, I remember, Will, us saying that, you know, oh, maybe there should be a crosswalk. <clears throat> um, what, did, we, did we put it mid-block for a reason, or was it just to connect the two trails? Wasn't that a staff comment? Yeah, that, I think I re recall as part of one of our initial staff comments was identifying the uh, desire and desire of the ordinance to connect pro projects to any um, uh, um, neighborhood <coughs> public pedestrian connections. And so I think our first comment was really about looking, asking the board and napkin to think about, you know, does, it, does a sidewalk down to Ocean Avenue? Is that sort of a preferred approach or pr the potential to provide connection to the existing public trails on Piper, which sneak down through and connect with the Higgins Beach neighborhood uh, right away uh, mm -hmm. sidewalks and so I think that was really the genesis of the discussion and and so far um, we had landed at the looking at the crosswalk and making the okay. connection through those public trails I, I guess so in um, the town's discussions with DOT do we happen to know where in their capital improvement planning that this may land or is it going to be subject to the PACS money and putting the right project in front of the PACS committees and things. Yeah, correct. Um, it is not on their latest work plan, DOTs, and typically it would go through um, the funding stream through PACS. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, um, I have been looking at trying to get funding through um, PACS for Spur Week, and really, because of the limited funds, they're really focusing on the priority corridors, which means yeah. Route 1 for Scarborough yep. is essentially where that money goes if there is any money to be had. So. It's, um, I don't see it in the near future. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Robin? Um, no, I, I guess I would just stress the need for a, a, an aggregate traffic study. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Yes, we, we, have, uh, we do have new mics before you had to um, push something to turn them off and now you have to push something to turn them on. Uh, so I believe this is on. Can you folks hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, <clears throat> I do recall that initial conversation uh, about the crosswalk uh, versus um, a sidewalk. And as I recall, there were a couple of elements that entered into it. And one of them was the uh, there was the design standards that really asked us to constantly consider how property could be interconnected. And as we looked at Spurwing, understanding the problems that uh, come simply with the increasing traffic on the road, uh, I think we looked at the option of putting in a sidewalk or requesting that, uh, requiring that Piper Shores put the sidewalk in, uh, and the 
um, what we were faced with was the possibility of simply a sidewalk to no place. In other words, it would be the length of Piper Shores and then it would end at Newcomb Road. Uh, so the folks at Newcomb Road could walk down to Acorn, but that would be, that would be it. So rather than do that, we started to look at the crosswalk and the connection that it would have to the trails at Piper Shores that were already existing. And that had some attraction, I believe, as I you know, search my memory, because uh, there would be more folks using the crosswalk to get to Piper Shores uh, rather than hopping in their cars to get down onto Spurwink, driving a short distance down uh, Spurwink, and then turning off at the Piper Shores, the current facility. And while um, I suspect the traffic study could give us a decent estimate of how many times per day that would happen, I, I, don't, I don't think it would happen many times. I don't think it would, the lack of a crosswalk would significantly impact the traffic, but there might be some, some impact. And that was the rationale that we used uh, as we started to look at creating that sort of a connection. Now, I do have uh, another question. Um, and uh, by the way, I do want to thank uh, Mr. Simino for uh, joining us at the, the site walk that we had last week in the pouring rain. Um, and uh, he and other folks, uh, abutters, have been very consistent in, in providing us with some, um, I guess, some human uh, reflections on how this project would, would affect them, and, and I appreciate that. I will also uh, reiterate, in a sense, what uh, Chairman McGee said, which is our, our responsibility is to uh, ensure that whatever the requirements are in terms of site review and design standards, that we pay attention to those, and that's what we're here to look at. We try to balance the issues of the abutters and the issues of the developers. And um, you know, good compromises mean sometimes that neither party is entirely happy. Uh, I hope that as this goes forward that what we can find and what the town council finds is a way that if neither party is entirely happy, each party can live with it. I do want to ask a couple of questions, so Will, if you could just get back up there. Uh, if there's no D MDOT uh, approval, then what are you going to do? What's next? Well, then I would think um, we have our contribution on the table, and you know we heard the same thing that from the abutters is there are safety concerns for pedestrians on Spurwink Road today. If this project never would happen, never happens, uh, they'll still be there. And it's not Piper Shore's responsibility to correct beyond their fair share of contribution. Oh, and then to benefit our residents, uh, there'll be a shuttle between this facility and the existing one for residents that want it would cross. All right, thank you. Um, I have uh, an additional question that was raised by, I believe, Mr. Mr. Jones or Jeff, uh, the gentleman who was up here earlier, and he had a question about the connectivity with the trailhead uh, at the parking area. And I do see that there is a connection between the uh, public parking uh, and the initial, uh, in one of the trails that is on, on, the, uh, on the site plan. But he also noted that there was a pretty large, let's say a two acre gap in between that public <coughs> parking and the conservation easement area. Is there any reason for that gap? Um, well, the, the gap is placed um, in this position basically so it includes this trail here that bisects the property. 
I mean, why is it not closer to the uh, parking? Well, because the, the, and Charlie mentioned it in his presentation, is the, and this is the trailhead, and there's connectivity from it to the conservation area mm -hmm. across these trails. <coughs> Probably want to answer that. Yeah, uh, I mean, Rachel, I'll just be uh, direct to your question, which <laughs> is, if that is put into permanent conservation easement, that acreage cannot be used, and by excluding it from permanent conservation easement, there is the potential that some kind of amenity at some point could be added. But not houses, if the no, the, no, the no, contract no. zone goes through. So of course, yeah. it might. Could you speculate on what kind of amenity might possibly be added back there? Could be a vegetable garden. Greenhouse, vegetable garden. The greenhouse is the one that we've discussed. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, good questions. They were actually some of the ones out of my list. Uh, Rick. Make sure yours is off, so I don't get the act. <laughs> um, I just have a couple of questions. You know, I realize you've got to go back before the town council um, to get the approval of the contract zone amendment. So this is just a preliminary approval of the site plan. But um, do you want to just make a note that in your uh, correspondence? There's a couple of things that you talk about, and one of the things that you're going to be bringing back to us is the protection plan for the abutters wells. Yes. So, originally, um, <clears throat> originally we, we talked about that, and um, so I'd like to, you know, I def we'll definitely be looking at that when it comes back. Is that we've um, already had conversations with S. W. Cole, who's done this on other projects, and we'll be actually retaining them and we'll bring them to the, to the next meeting, and they can walk you through it. It's a very comprehensive. Um, Rick, uh, Rick, if it helps any, I have uh, that particular item outlined for part two of our discussion, which is suggestions to the council to include in contract zone language okay. would be protection of wells. Okay. So I think that's a, a really good spot for it rather than the technical site plan that we're looking at, just gotcha. as a heads up. It's good guidance. Um, all right, uh, technically though, the, uh, it, whether that crosswalk gets approved or not is yet to be seen, but um, in one of your correspondence in, in response to the um, peer review that was done and included the uh, crash data, so the, the crash, the, um, the Crashes that occurred in 2015 and 16 were all left-hand turns. Um, I guess it, if we don't get the crosswalk for some reason or the crosswalk doesn't happen, um, we may, I may be looking or talking to staff about if, if we can do some sort of signage just to make people aware that there's additional turning traffic in that area do something to try to mitigate those left-hand crashes. Sure. Reasonable. Okay. Um, other than that, I think the rest of the comments I have have to do with the actual contract zone amendment language. So. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Jen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I just want to start by thanking those of you that came to the walk the other day. Um, it was not an especially lovely day to be outside, um, but several of you joined us. And someone threw out the um, invitation that we visit Newcomb Ridge Road and some of the other um, abutting streets, which I did in the short time that I had left um, before I had to get back to work. I also drove down... Um, onto the existing Piper Shores campus and just uh, took a look around there for um, context and reference. And um, I learned a couple of things. One was that despite the rain, and it was, it was pretty cold 
um, and from someone who normally wouldn't, like I stayed in my car, it was, I wasn't like, yeah, I want to jump out and check out these trails or something like that. And I knew that there were some trails on the Piper Shore property, um, but I've never been on them myself. I saw three people out walking that day, crossing uh, the driveway and, and other ones, and maybe that's, a, maybe that's an anomaly, but, but it surprised me. Um, and what I was able to see, at least from my car, was that the trails that it looked like they were heading to, I think a couple of people were walking dogs, um, some into the woods, some on your internal trails that are there today. Um, they all looked to be, you know, uh, well-maintained, easy to find, and um, I just, you know, I think that speaks highly of what you may be offering. So when you're talking about offering other trails on other project, uh, on this other project, um, I would encourage anyone else to perhaps go take a look at that because I know that there are other um, projects in this town and other towns where a lot of times that has that is offered up at the front and either maintenance is good at the beginning and sort of trails off um, or the trails may be difficult to find for the public or residents um, but again from my from my limited window shopping there that's that's sort of what I observed um, and I just you know it was certainly ha having walked on the Dorado Drive site out in the you know fields um, <coughs> and the hills, the perspective from Newcomb Ridge in particular was definitely different from what I found um, to be on site. So I appreciated that as well. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the crosswalk, I'm curious if you have a sense of schedule from when DOT may be getting back to you on um, their opinion on that crosswalk. Uh, well, depending on how this evening goes, we'll talk very soon with the town manager. And Angela, as well, will be engaged in that process. Okay. So very soon. Um, the other comment that I had is sort of back to the uh, back to the trails and um, somewhat tied into the crosswalk. So if you're talking about this as being an amenity both to your residents but also to the public and inviting people to come in. Um, and use use this facility, and in particular, if we're going to entertain the idea of having um, a crosswalk, which will, my guess is that anything on 77 in this area will not just be signs and paint. There will be some sort of something else <laughs> there. Um, is that it be that, that you spend a little time thinking about the difference between making a facility like that available to the public and making something inviting to the public. And so I looked through um, the plans that were submitted, and I may have missed it, but something that didn't jump out at me was any sort of um, wayfinding or signage that might indicate to the public that there is public parking at the way back of this property. And so that's, um, it's great to, it's great to offer that. I think, um, you know, you, you, there's, You've increased the spaces, as you said, but as someone who doesn't know that that's there, I might not continue navigating through your what would feel like someone else's neighborhood um, in the effort to look for a, a public place to get on um, to trails that are available to the public and your other neighbors. Um, <clears throat> so that's it on the cross. Could I respond to your signage request? Sure. So Please let me know if it was in there and I didn't see it. No, you didn't okay. miss anything. Um, <laughs> it'll be in there at final. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and also the road names. We haven't really branded the project yet, but we'll be doing that, hopefully, if, if we get favorable results this <clears> evening. <throat> um, regarding signs, the Piper Shores residents make hundred of, hundreds of signs for the Scarborough Land Trust. And we'll be happy to include those in directing people to the trailhead. Yeah, sure. So I know um, I'm familiar with a lot of the Portland trails, tra trail networks, and I, you know, um, also sensitive to not encouraging in our community or anyone else's community any more signs because I feel like there are so many signs on so many different things. But you know, um, I think with with sort of like small but consistent um, messaging, you could you could certainly accomplish a lot in the way of helping others find um, this amenity that you're offering to the community. Um, I did also have a question about how, uh, if not walking, which is obviously an option that you're providing, um, how residents and or staff will be getting between 
this facility and your existing facility? And someone mentioned that there um, might be a shuttle. Yes. Offering that. Wonder, wondering if there's you have any sense on how frequent that might be or how many trips you think may We haven't that really, uh, we don't know definitively, but it'll be literally, you know, all the way <coughs> into the evening. Okay. Um, and the only other um, question that I had on this has already been asked, but I'm going to ask it again because I think it's important. <laughs> Um, and that is that I also noticed that, that the conservation easement stops short of the um, public parking area, but in particular those wetlands. And so, um, you know, you've, you've said, we've talked about that this is it for um, approved housing units on the site, but that um, in a sort of a common sense way, I, I sort of think of a conservation easement as a way to, you know, preserve land. And on the back end of this, perhaps the intent is to preserve land for these trails, but I think that the wetlands weren't um, some thought to. And so if, if the original placement of this line was intended to leave land for additional housing units or whatever, it's, you know, it's your call about what your um, development build out is. Um, but I do think, you know, that those, um, that the wetlands there provide some value as they do anywhere. Um, and so, you know, I think if you're, if you're not going to be building there, then either just thinking about ways that you may be able to work around those or, um, or consider them for conservation as well. Oh. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. Did you have something to add? <laughs> <laughs> we, we wanted to just point out that the reason we're on this side of the street is because there are 96 acres in conservation easement on the other side of the street. And so there's been some discussion of looking at the project as an aggregate. There's 105 out of 170 acres in permanent conservation easement. Thank you. Thank you. That is, I didn't know that about the other side, so thank you for pointing that out. Rick, mind getting. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about a crosswalk. I think we've all <laughs> talked about the thank crosswalk. Um, in staying true to our charge is what we do here in the planning board and looking over all the submitted um, documents by staff and the vetting of, of their efforts um, I'm content um, I feel like uh, the only thing that might uh, I like the idea of an aggregate traffic um, study just so we can big picture look at what's going on in that uh, area and ensure that uh, we're not doing more harm uh, than we are good with with what's going on. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, this is this is question one, right? Um, now, generally, from what I've heard from most of the comments here, there is definitely a level of comfort with the plans as they've drawn up. And I'll kind of highlight a couple of the areas, too, that I think that the applicant has made significant improvements on from some of their original renditions. Your buffering is within our, you know, our guidelines. The uh, addition of open space, conservation land. It, you know, clearly you had been paying attention to some of the public comment, and we appreciate the efforts there. Um, you know, the design and layout and the structures, the architecture, uh, we haven't heard much for comments because I think everyone here pretty much agrees that regardless of where this is located, it's, it's designed well. So um, kudos to the team for presenting um, a plan that really kind of uh, jives well with what our, our ordinances and setbacks and requirements and, and things like that would be. Um, if I had to um, echo any comments I'm hearing tonight from my fellow port board members is um, the inclusion of those wetlands into a conservation um, area, considering that you're not going to be considering building new housing units in that area, I think would be a welcomed addition to any plans you offer for going forward. Um, and I say that only because I'm not sure I'm thrilled about anything being built on wetlands, including you know a greenhouse or, or anything like that. I'm, I'm not sure that really makes me uh, all that satisfied either. Wetlands are one of those things that we try very hard um, to, to protect. We even ask 
you know, uh, developers to try to keep them off of private lands when they go to put a parcel on uh, paper. So, um, you know, I would hope that maybe as you go forward, you would kind of reconsider some of that. Um, you know, the crosswalk, I believe that that has been discussed. I really feel, um, you know, the team should probably really consider a plan B. I think there's some, some healthy skepticism as whether or not that crosswalk would get approved through state uh, main dot. Um, so I think, you know, trying to beefen up maybe a plan B on that aspect. Uh, I'm sure you perhaps feel like you've satisfied that requirement, but I don't think it would hurt in this situation to really go back and discuss it a little further. Um, so, so all of that um, being said, uh, sensing a general comfort with the site plan, the, the traffic study, um, you know, I'd like, I'd like to hear what staff's opinion. We do have uh, currently, you know, we have uh, Bill Bray's information here on, a, on the traffic study. Uh, it, was, it was peer reviewed, I believe. Um, you know, I'd like to hear whether or not staff feels generally satisfied with the way traffic study has been handled in relation to the current ordinances in place, standards. Can, can I ask a question that's somewhat related to that? Sure. Do you know if there's any, um, is there any other capacity, or maybe even the applicant knows, um, any other capacity left to build out on the existing site? Um, do you know so what I, on do you the know existing I mean? Piper Shores right. property, so that, In terms that of property their zoning. is controlled by the, the contract zone that spells out the type of development and the number of units and where development can occur. Um, I would say, I, actually the applicant was before this board not too long ago with a, a little s parking lot expansion, I think within the last year or so, maybe it's been longer than that, but um, they're they are pretty hemmed in on the other side of the road in terms of conservation easement areas. Um, is that to say there isn't anywhere else? I can't say that for sure, but it's um, it's pretty limited. Um, I think it's a, a fair. Nick, and if I could also fair. make one comment regarding um, our review relative to the current ordinances and zoning and remind us that if this is contract zoning um, whether it's an amendment or a beginning contract zone, um, the whole purpose for the, the applicant <clears throat> to be able to waive the RF restrictions is so that they can provide some public benefit. And if this board would like a recommendation <coughs> that the public benefit should include sidewalk or you know, wellhead protection areas or the like. I just, I just want to remind folks that, yes, we are doing an <coughs> ordinance review, but we're also looking at other technical <coughs> issues because of it being a contract zone. I think that um, goes to that second part of what our discussion will be, which is the language that's being presented to us in the amended contract zone. If we, we can make a recommendation to what maybe the council should be considering and something like that I think would fall under that purview, we can make a recommendation, but at the end of the day, it really is in the, in the hands of the, the council to really figure out whether or not it aligns with our comp plan, whether or not, you know, the public benefit has been reached. That's, that's all decisions that happen on their level, not necessarily ours, but I think certainly given <coughs> that we get the front row seats onto a lot of this planning, we're in a really good position to help offer some insights into what we think might help you know, with that that aspect of it. Yeah, and along that same line of compatibility with the comprehensive plan and um, what did, what's the other thing that it says? And consistency, uh, no, consistency with the comprehensive plan and compatibility with the existing and permitted uses. Um, has, has there been a, has the applicant prepared a memo or anything speaking to that? It's Exhibit C. Exhibit the contract C. Zone. Oh, I thought that was the the public benefit. It, uh, yeah, Exhibit C is just the public benefit, oh, but, but I'm just but talking. Beneath each benefit is the consistency with the comp plan. There's a uh, right, but how about compatibility with the existing uses, uh, permitted uses? I, I think that actually is also a question that gets okay. answered by the town council, ultimately, not this. 
you know, the applicant can make, an, can make their argument that they are consistent with current zoning and all that stuff. Right. Whether or not that it determined that final determination is really met made by the council. So I'm going to circle back to my original question, which had to do with the staff's level of comfort with the amount of submitted material based on traffic studies for this amended project. Yeah, so I think um, in terms of the expectation for this submission, they obviously, as already stated, we've had our peer review look at it, and they've provided their comments. I do think that if um, the board is so inclined to ask the applicant to take a look at the aggregate impacts, that certainly in your purview, um, and, you know, I'm not, I guess it would be helpful to understand exactly in terms of, because when this traffic uh, analysis was done, the, in, the existing traffic generated out of Piper Shores is understood as part of what's happening on the streetscape. So just really looking for exactly what it is the board would like to see out of that review. But I think if that's what a bit of information you feel that, that would be necessary to move forward either before preliminary or I think, you know, something that might be able to be addressed before fi between preliminary and final as well. Um, be interested to get your thoughts. Yeah, so if I couldn't jump in. I th this is something like, <clears throat> personally, I feel like if they came back to me with a full study, it was the most complete study we ever had, I think they're still at the same crossroads that we're at tonight. I'm not sure we're going to move that ball much further. They still need to go through before MDOT, and they still need to talk about that crosswalk. There's still possibly traffic calming measures that would have to take place. So, you know, for for these purposes, I'm, I'm I think we could probably request it in the meantime. As whether or not it's a hurdle, I feel like personally that I feel like they need to overcome to um, have us consider what they have submitted here for their site plan. I'm not personally convinced that I need to see that to make a determination as to whether their current site plan submission aligns well enough with what we're looking at. Nick, that's, can I, that's can my I add that might help a little too is um, what we're talking about from the other side and their, what they had to do for traffic back from the beginning of the process. And you look at, I think Will alluded to, was um, the number of trips for this side of the road. Um, in DOT terms is very low and it is something that we could look at anyway, but I think as far as the thresholds that get triggered, if it helps it at all with the board's comfort level, then I think because of those numbers are at the level they're at, it doesn't seem like a big lift, I would think, for Sebago um, traffic engineers to kind of provide that memo in, in between before it comes mm -hmm. back to the board. And I think you're going to see that needle's not going to move a whole lot. I don't <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, th is there any other comments site plan related that anyone feels that they want to bring up real quick before we move to the real fun part, which is part two? Um, I found Jen. one other note that I made. I'm sorry. Yeah. I think on um, some of the sheets where you were showing, there were notes that said, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, starting with sheet. Hit your mic, yeah. Move it a little closer to <laughs> again. Um, starting with sheet 7 of 30, which was um, the, the grading sheet series, um, which is very helpful in terms of showing the limits of um, earthwork, but I don't think that your existing tree line is showing up, which makes it hard to see uh, which areas of trees will be kept and which ones um, will be taken down. I, I don't know if you've got a bad photocopy or what, but we'll make sure with the next submission that they're visible. Anything else? No? Okay, so let's move the discussion to part two, which is um, thoughts, recommendations uh, that this board I uh, would like to have the town council take under consideration for when uh, they potentially see this project next. So, who wants to kick off this portion? Robin? Um, I was going to nominate Rick. You had such a good idea. Oh. Here we go, Rick. Thank you, Robin. 
Well, that was actually um, something that was mentioned in um, Sebago Technics' uh, response. So they're already aware of it, although I didn't see it in the actual um, contract zone um, amendment. I don't see, I didn't see anywhere in here where it mentioned the, um, the wells. So that definitely, under sewer and water, it says the facility will be served by both public water and public sewer. And it goes into setbacks and things like that. But um, unless I missed it, and I don't think I did because I went through this like 10 times, there's nothing in here that that requires, <clears throat> and they've already agreed to do it. So, but I would like to see it in here that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try something a little different here. Um, so we have well protection measures. That's what we would like to call a water protect well, water drinkable protection measures. Existing. The water, water quality. quality and quantity of the existing wells must be maintained for a minimum of five years or something, however it... That's well said. So as a board, do we generally agree that that's a great suggestion to make to the council to look as for language they should be including in this contract zone? I see all the heads nodding, so that will be one recommendation we'll be passing along. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and Rick, keep going if you have more suggestions. Uh, well, the other one... We briefly talked about on the technical side, but it also has to do with um, if <clears throat> I know there's we talked about sidewalk and crosswalk and things like that, but it, there's no language in here that um, requires a, a minimum of increased signage or something. And I don't know if that's I guess that doesn't need to be in here. We can cover that when we get it back. It's true. Yeah. So. I'm, other than the wells, I think everything else in here um, covers pretty much what should be in a contract zone amendment. So, yeah. Robin. All right. Uh, somewhat related to what Rick is saying is I know that we originally were talking about the, the, the groundwater uh, volume issues arising from the blasting. And um, I'd also like to recommend that there be some type of... Um, and I think Will had talked that there is a ge geotechnical analysis by S.W. Cole, who's coming online, but just to look at the potential impacts of blasting um, through the ledge and the, the proximity of a butter. So sort of maybe an, a seismic analysis or some other type of <coughs> geotechnical analysis to make sure that a butter's foundations, um, in addition to their um, sort of groundwater supply, is preserved. How do, uh -oh. board, how do uh -oh. we feel about getting, that? How I'm do getting we feel about the suggestion look. of some sort of protections from um, impacts of blasting on abutting neighbors? So if I could ask for a clarification, because sure. you, you sort of referenced beyond wells and foundations, which are typically the things, <coughs> in my limited nope. knowledge, nope. are nope. understood. Nope, that's exactly so. what I'm talking about, okay. is the foundations and wells. So okay. to have geotechnical that. analysis yeah. uh, give some type of assurances that they will not be impacted. Okay. So Thank in addition to, and I guess that was what I was missing, you're really talking about maybe a, an analysis in advance that says, look, this should be okay. And what I'm hearing Rick talk about is really doing that follow-up analysis that says, yes, it, it is okay, or here's, yeah. here was the problem. And is where that, I'm going, Jay, is yeah. that it's somewhat related. Once they start yeah. the blasting, sure. the groundwater levels can drop rapidly. Um, but what I've seen in the submissions before is in addition to the typical blasting plan where you have to do just, you know, like basically this is your, your affected area, it's a little bit beyond that. Yeah, so I wanted to just be clear that what I've seen presented in the documents is just not quite enough. And, okay. and I'd like to follow up. Okay. Um, what I've seen, what I have seen in the past uh, having built a house on Ledgefield Circle, um, was that the condition of the existing basements is actually documented prior to the blasting and, and afterwards. And then the, the wells are a little bit trickier because a well may not be affected the day after the blasting or the week after the blasting, but a year after the blasting. It could be a result of that blasting. So um, I would leave that to Woodward and Kern or whoever, whoever we happen to contract yeah. with to figure that out. I think that's a good question. Is there a specific company or is Woodward Curran, our current 
peer reviewers, are they capable of this type of study or oversight of a, of a study of this nature? I guess we'll have to have a conversation with them on that. And I think at this point where we're really talking about suggestions for the contract zone, we would have time to work with, um, uh, certainly with uh, folks to find someone who could help us. I will just um, sort of let um, the board know that there, um, Larrabee Farm, the wetland mitigation um, contract zone, actually had some sort of well protection language embedded in there as well. And so a, a sort of analysis, uh, ongoing analysis. So it might be something, um, you know, that we could look to if, if council would choose us to go in this direction as well. Sort of seeing the nodding of the heads, I'm thinking this is where the board's headed as well. So um, I just sort of, I think we do have something to start with. Maybe it needs to get modified because that is di a very much a different use. It was a, it's a, a, you know, they were doing excavation and really getting into um, doing some other type of work. So, um, but anyway, there might be some framework there. All right. So I think we have a good suggestion in there. Is there another suggestion anyone has for this contract zone they'd like to see included? Yes, Rob. Um, I mine would be <clears throat> that. Uh, there is, I think the applicant has done a tremendous job with the, showing the public benefit. That's a tremendous improvement. And as Mr. Katz Levy or Levy Katz had mentioned, that um, <laughs> uh, the consistency with the comp plan is there, but I think we are missing that link of sort of documenting the compatibility with the existing and permitted uses in this area, which is a requirement of the contract zone. Council will have to weigh in okay. on that. I'm just saying, is this a recommendation that we want to make to the, am we I We were looking for kind of language that the council should be including in their document that they get the vote on. Got it. You know what I mean? Uh, those determinations, I think they, they're aware of that they're, those are determinations they need to make in order for this to go anywhere. Sure. I guess yeah. what I'm seeing though, Nick, is that the public benefit is here and that the, um, and that the consistency with the comp plan is here. So it's just missing that third well, thing we don't in, the language. Any of that. <laughs> in the language. In the language. In the language. Okay. Uh, any other suggestions? Yes, Rachel. Yeah, I. There is a staff comment here that um, the staff uh, recommends the importance of the language uh, for the public pedestrian network and the public use of the sidewalks be added to the to the C contract zone amendment, and I just wanted to make sure that that somehow or other wasn't lost, but that does need to be on there. And I do want to um, applaud the, uh, the folks from Piper Shores for increasing the amount of affordable housing initiative, uh, affordable housing money that they have put into this. Um, I've long thought that the amount of money that uh, Scarborough charges um, for affordable housing uh, for each unit is simply not in keeping with the cost of housing. Uh, and the amount that um, Piper Shores is offering to put in is substantially more to, than what is actually required. And uh, it should be in the zoning amendment, certainly. Um, but I, I do thank them for listening to us when we had that first workshop and our concerns that we had about affordable housing. Thank you, Rachel. Roger. Um, to piggyback on um, what Jen was talking about before about um, wayfinding signs mm -hmm. and a little bit with what Rachel just mentioned, um, I, I, I would like to see... <laughs> um, I would like to see, uh, especially on a spur wink, uh, some sort of signage that mentions the trails, the public trails, and the, and the public is welcome. Because I know as a resident, I've never gone down there to the existing site. I know you've always had public trails there. And I suspect a lot of residents just don't, they just feel not comfortable going down there, thinking that this is not, you know, this is not like Larrabee Farms or something like that. So if there was some nice signage right on, you know, Spurwing to indicate that the public is Welcome to the trails. Is that something you feel should be in the contract amendment well, zone it's, language, it's, or is it something that you think we should be considering for a for the, you know a final subdivision review or planning review? I'll leave it up to whatever. You, you know, I, I just think it should. I think be the applicant's taking note of it, yeah, and staff as well. Um, 
Do you have any other suggestions here for the contract zone? Just to echo the importance of the pedestrian connection. That's all. Thank you. Rick, do you have anything? Do we want to make sure anything on the lighting, uh, on the timing of the lights, or try to maintain as much dark sky as possible? I think the applicant is, pro is proposing that 11 o'clock dimming feature. Should that go in the amendment, or is that something that... I so we, we do have, in the site plan review ordinance, it requires that. So um, It requires a shutoff time? Uh, well, it requires that there be, um, you know, limit, limit, limits the amount of spillover to uh, butters, and yeah. then it gives, uh, uh, provides opportunity for the board to work with the applicant on having full shutoff. So that, that, that is existing language that the board okay. can apply, um, but certainly, you know, Things can be added I mean, the, the photometric zone, but, indicated that it yep. was zero on, you know, on the abutters, but I just want to make sure but, that but that doesn't creep back in and somehow all of a sudden you can see Piper Shores from Buxton. Sure. I, I guess the only thing I would offer is typically the contract zone is really designed at targeting those things that aren't already embedded in the ordinance that are above and be, you okay. know, are, are different. So I would just offer that we do have existing language that the board can enforce. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. So look at. Yeah. I can just offer that we typically see a plan note that addresses that on a site plan. Right. That's how we, the board's dealt with it in the past. So, um, my no, I think we've covered one and two, and now number three. Are there any loose ends or items we'd like to bring up regarding the submission that we haven't covered already, based on anything you've seen in staff comments, the applicants, um, their their presentation? Anything? We thoroughly handled this. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm I'm going to say this. Um, you know, everyone here has been fantastic. Uh, this audience, you've been respectful. I appreciate that um, all evening. Uh, it's not easy to assemble 100 plus people in a room and still be able to conduct a meeting. So kudos to you out here, and thank you for speaking up and giving us your opinions on this. Um, so here. You know, for, for what it's worth for the people in this room, again, this is not the last we'll ever see of this. <clears throat> the question that's before us as a board right now is do we feel satisfied enough with what we've seen on the drawings, the, the plans that have met the requirements laid out before us? And the other question we should be asking ourselves is um, I'm going to make the motion for a preliminary site plan and sub, uh, subdivision uh, approval at this point. It's a preliminary. <coughs> is there a big benefit to seeing this again before it gets passed to council? And I think that's what we should be asking ourselves as planning board members. How much more information do you think we could really possibly take in on these drawings and setbacks and whatnot that we haven't already seen? So as I make this motion, um, just consider all of those factors. And I will move to grant preliminary provisional site and subdivision plan approval for the project titled Piper Shores Dorado Site proposed by Maine Life Care Community, Inc., as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics, dated 4-12-19, with the following conditions. Conditions, one, prior to the submission of a final site and subdivision plan application, the contract zone agreement and plan set shall be revised to address the staff review comments in the memorandum, memorandum dated 4-29-19 and as discussed during the board's deliberation. That is the motion before us. Second. I have a second. Discussion. I'm going to point out uh, for everyone else here, this, this, uh, this motion does not address whether or not this is compatible with the comprehensive plan. It does not address whether or not it is a public benefit. Your counselors will be taking up those topics. The next step in this process is to get them what we have here so the council can look at this plan and make those decisions as they go forward. So, Nick, and to which I would just comment that I believe the applicant has shown uh, the demonstrated public interest and the consistency with the comprehensive plan, but I have not seen the compatibility with existing and permitted uses. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion in the second? Please know that my vote in favor means that eventually we'll see this compatibility with existing permit and uses. Thank you. Any other discussion? <coughs> All in favor? I show that as unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, good luck at your next step. And for the public, uh, please keep an eye out for any public notices regarding when they will be back up on the council's agenda.
I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. This time we are going to take about a five-minute break. It's been two hours, and we're going to go stretch our legs. Thank you.
Sounds like the crowd is ready. Here we go. Welcome back. We are going to jump right in. Magenta LLC requests a site plan review for 40 Haggis Parkway, Assessor's Map, R50, Lot 35. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, as you guys are well aware, this project is located in the Haggis Parkway zone, uh, located along the western side of the parkway. So the applicant's in front of the board tonight with a site plan for phase one of the multi-phase development. It includes a 10,000 square foot building containing two 5,000 square foot units for lease. Uh, so given that the project will disturb one or more acres, the stormwater requirements of four, Chapter 419 uh, do apply to this project. As the board may recall, one of the primary elements discussed during previous reviews of the project was the importance of coordinating the proposed driveway entrance along the parkway with the Scarborough Downs redevelopment project. Since the last board meeting, the applicant has coordinated with the Downs team and they're proposing a phase plan that maintains the existing access to the project site. The plan also notes that any further development at 40 Hikus Parkway would require the applicant to establish a new driveway to the site in coordination with any proposed curb cuts along the parkway. Staff is generally comfortable with this approach um, and has prepared a condition of approval for the board's consideration. Staff would also like to point out the applicant did receive final approval uh, for the proposed curb cut from Maine DOT. This was sent uh, to staff late last week. And finally, uh, staff would like to point out that the zoning ordinance requires graphic representations of how the development will look upon completion of any project in this zoning district. Uh, the board will need to determine if the scale, location, or nature of the project uh, does not warrant these graphics. Staff would recommend that the boat board vote on this as it would be an allowed waiver from the zoning standards. Uh, these are the main elements for the board to review this evening. Uh, there are a number of other remaining elements as noted in staff's comments that can be reviewed administratively if the board is comfortable. Thank you. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, and just a quick uh, side note for members up here on the board. We had some feedback that it is a little tough for them to hear in the back of the room. So if we're going to speak, if we could just try to get that microphone a little closer, that would help out for everyone else. Uh, Kerry. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. My name is Kerry Anderson, representing Magenta LLC. We were here last at the April 8th meeting and we left the meeting with a understand or feeling that the board was generally satisfied with the uh, elevations for the first building on the first lot. We did, uh, as Jamel had mentioned, bring, uh, submit the MDOT permit that we received and also a letter uh, that we will work with the Crossroads Development with their entrance uh, to make sure that there isn't a separation distance problem with uh, the entrance we have here into phase one. Uh, along with that, we, a couple of the comments that also came from that meeting were the radius when you first uh, come in, that has been elongated to relax that a little bit. And the only other comment that I'm aware of was the, uh, was we were asked to uh, remove the sewer coming up through this area right here and to run it down along here and then up into the property. The problem with that is the, the water district has got a water line that comes along this area here and their separation distance that they require uh, would result in us having to remove a lot of the trees along here. So we, we want to keep the sewer coming up through here. It would be the least amount of trees to, uh, to rip up. And with that, uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, this is also an opportunity, I don't know, why no public comment this evening? It's been reviewed before, and uh, public comment has been provided before. So you can ask for it if you'd like. Well, as your chairman, I do love the public. Would anyone like to speak? <laughs> <laughs> I only said that because I didn't think so. But uh, <laughs> in any case, let's move on. Um, do Roger, you want to kick this one off too? Um, I, I think the, um, the big issue here was the, was the driveway, the access. And as I understand it, it's sort of been resolved. <coughs> uh, the 
Is that correct? So I have no other issues uh, with it right now. Thank you. Oh, uh, what? I didn't have my microphone. I didn't have this on. We're going to say that uh, you, you found that the only issue had been resolved. Yeah, virtually. You want me to repeat everything? I don't think you need to. <laughs> Jen, would you like to add? Um, I'm, could you just explain again the, um, you're talking about a radius, the radius into the site being changed. Was that from Hagus Parkway or on, onto the site? Uh, when we met, when we, when we were at the last meeting, I believe there was comment that it asked about this radius right here being flattened out a little bit to make for easier turns in, oh. and that's been done. Okay. I'm, I'm all set other than that. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Rick Meinking. No, I'm all set. I saw the, uh, the update. Oh, I'll turn mine on. <laughs> um, I saw the bowlers that you put in for the uh, adding some of that uh, lighting on on that uh, handicap entrance way. Uh, so I think we're we're there. Thank you, Rick Dupere. Um I thought it looked good. The only question I have is actually uh, in the introduction. Jamal asked us to um, talk about the, fa the facade that we. Yeah. You got that, Robert? Yeah, the, the, the uh, members. Huh. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't, I didn't see that in here uh, as far as. Do you want to put that board uh, up for? Thanks. Yeah. I, yeah, I think we, this was submitted. I'm not certain. I didn't make the submission, but... Okay. Yeah, I, I thought we had seen that before and talked about the color, so unless anything's changed, I'm good with what we saw last time. Okay. Can I just... Sure. Go ahead, Jamal. I'd just like to point out the zoning standard requires a graphic of the site as it would look from the parkway, not a building elevation, um, but if this is adequate, then just be sure to state that. Right. We do yeah, need, no, to, we do need to actually waive that requirement if we're going to waive it. Right. Thanks for that uh, clarification, Jamal, because I was a little confused. Um, yeah, for this particular site, I've been by there a few times, I, and I think I can, based on the complexity, you know, the, the uncomplexity of this site and the facade, I would be able to waive it. Thank you. Rachel? Um, I, I do note that you've uh, added extra landscaping to the back, as we had discussed, and I appreciate that. Um, I would ordinarily ask to see the, the graphic illustration, but you've been before us enough, and we've had a lot of discussion about uh, both the landscaping and the architecture, so I'm content uh, to waive that. Uh, and I do note that um, while we normally request that the back of a building uh, not be blank, that you, you have provided enough uh, variation to the back uh, that I don't think we need to, um, we don't need to put in windows. So other than that, I am content. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Robin. Um, yeah, I guess I would agree um, <coughs> that you have a longstanding um, relationship here with the board and and the need for graphic representation is is minimal um, everything else looks looks good congratulations to your engineer on going to Coral Palmer that was news to me so um, other than that I'm good thank you Robin um, so I'm just gonna quickly uh, take a straw poll is everyone here good with the waiver of the zoning issue whereas the architectural drawings for that yeah. no. okay great uh, and then also just as a quick straw, straw poll here, everyone's okay with the current proposed sewer location versus what was recommended in staff comments based on the information just provided to us? Yes. Yes? Excellent. Let's, uh, let's get this through. We have seen you four or five times now, so. Six. Six? <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> let's go. All right, thank you. So I have a motion here. 
I move to approve the project titled Phase 1 Site Plan proposed by Magenta LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Stantec and Goral Palmer dated 4 11 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to construct a 10,000 square foot building containing two 5,000 square foot units for lease. Each unit will include approximately 4,000 square feet of light industrial use with a possible 1,000 square feet of office space. The property is located within the Highest Parkway Zoning District and is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map R50, lot 35. The board granted master plan approval for the entire project on February 25th, 2019. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses <coughs> the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers. Given the scale, location, and nature of the proposed Phase 1 development, the Board waives the requirement of a graphic representation of the site per Section <coughs> 18B2B3 in the zoning ordinance. Conditions. The project entrance is acceptable in providing access to 40 Higus Parkway site for the first phase of development. However, further development of the 40 Higus Parkway property will require a full site plan review at which time the entrance location shall be reconsidered and the <coughs> final location will be determined on the merits of the development proposal and in coordination with other site access points along Higus Parkway corridor. Two, prior issuance of a building permit. The plan set shall be revised to include A, a revised parking matrix per the staff review comments mm -hmm. memo dated 42919. B, a revised auto turn simulation for a 40 foot long ladder truck. C, a modified radi radii design adjacent to bioretention filter number three. D, the elimination of the portion of sidewalk located within the island at the front entrance of the site. E, a revised plunge pool and flow dispersion detail on sheet C73. This detail shall correspond with the dimensions depicted on the grading, drainage, and erosion control plan, sheet C 4.0. <coughs> F, the required plan note indicating the site is subject to Chapter 419, Post-Construction Stormwater Infrastructure Management Ordinance. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall coordinate with a fire department, the town engineer, on the following elements per the staff review comments memo dated 4-29-19. A, a revised auto turn simulation for a 40 foot long ladder truck. B, the proposed radii adjacent to bioretention filter three. And four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the, A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, pay the in lieu fee in the amount equal to the estimated construction of a sidewalk along the Highest Parkway frontage. The funds are to be directed to the town's multimodal reserve account. C, execute and record and maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Five, prior to the issuance of a signage permit, the applicant shall submit a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Six, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the Planning Department. That is the, the entirety of the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? So that's unanimous. Good luck. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you very much. Next item tonight, Pine Point Grill requests a site plan amendment for 240 Pine Point Road, Assessor's Map U25, Lot 16. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This project's located in the residential district along Pine Point Road. As you may recall, the applicant was before the board in early April for an advisory opinion review as part of the applicant's miscellaneous appeal to the zoning board. The zoning board did grant approval in April and is before the board for a site plan amendment review this <coughs> evening. The applicant is proposing to utilize the outdoor patio on the property for seasonal outdoor sit-down table service. Accordingly, they are proposing to increase the parking uh, by providing additional spaces at the Blue Point Congregational Church located next door to meet the town's off-street parking requirements. The proposal is generally the same as the advisory opinion review. Uh, during this review, the board did request that the applicant provide some additional signage and a crosswalk across Bradford Lane to ensure that patrons who park at the church could safely access the <coughs> restaurant. <coughs> Staff has provided a host of review comments and also prepared a draft motion uh, for the board's consideration tonight. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jamal. Would you like to please state your name and introduce the aspects of your project that we have yet to cover? Uh, my, my name is Paul Landry. I'm the uh, re recently purchased 
uh, Pine Point Grill uh, facility from Chio Maselli. Uh, we're looking to uh, offer table service on the patio uh, when the weather provides. Uh, we've shown that we've been able to increase our parking to accommodate that table service, and we don't have any issues with what the uh, board's recommendations are with regards to signage and what have you. Thank you. I appreciate the brief presentation. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment on this. Is there anyone here that would like to speak <coughs> on this topic? Please approach the podium. Seeing none, public comment is closed. Uh, does anyone on this board have any comments to offer on this project? We have seen it once before. Uh, is it once? Is it twice? Once? I just have a quick question for staff, sure. really. Um, how, do we, how do we ensure that this off-site parking runs with the land? I mean, I know that the congregational church isn't necessarily going to go belly up, but uh, how do we know that this runs with the land? Uh, the applicants provided a lease agreement okay. um, with the application materials, and then I don't know if you guys want to talk to that uh, better than I could. I mean, we do have a yearly lease with the congregation. I, I guess that's your point. You know, if something happens to that. I'm not sure what. Right. You know, that's yeah. But, I mean, we're just looking for you know to have table service currently. Yeah. Would it be wise to include some sort of language that um, allows for the extra restaurant space? contingent upon the lease being renewed for parking spaces? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Is that? You certainly could. It would be, you know, belt and suspenders approach, but it would be very clear. And if it's in the... It seems like it is now. I mean, in that, you know, yeah. how, if, if the lease were to, like, the, be discontinued, then there's then no... Then it would be considered in violation exactly. of their approval. So yep. certainly if you want okay. to add it as part of your uh, approval notes to really just make it very, as I said, sort of a belt and suspenders approach to make it very mm -hmm. explicit. Yep. Be, uh, I know this, this, this had happened in the immediate to be able to provide table service, but uh, this will allow us at least 12 months uh, to review other alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, it does appear that we have uh, enough additional land to provide the the 12 spaces, oh, okay. uh, in which case I'll come back and enjoy this yeah. process yet again. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and I think the approach that I'm suggesting is still, you know, a good faith effort kind of a thing, and it's not meant to, to be complicated in any stretch of the imagination, but just to... For, for clarifications, I, I, I believe the approval allows a cocktail service as a waiting area uh, that didn't require this process that had been approved before so oh, yeah I saw that email and, in the worst and you case, sold me so yeah, I'll be down in, in, the worst case, in the worst case scenario uh, we would just suspend food service if there was an issue excellent on that's that. the other thing I was looking for excellent at least uh, it, it provides us at least 12 months to remedy excellent uh, in the event there's an issue good idea love it thank you anyone else have anything to add to this Rachel yeah, I, I guess I just have a question. The, the uh, patio is pretty sparse. Are you going to have trash receptacles out there or a weight station, reservation station, or anything like that, or is it simply the table and chairs? Uh, tables, chairs, and whatever other accommodations I, I need to be able to accommodate folks that are sitting out there. So it'll be cleaned up nightly if we bring a, a, weight, a weight station out there. It'll be inside. <coughs> Uh, at the end of the service, and and in the event of inclement weather, it won't be out there for sure. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Any other comments from the board? Okay. That being said, I do have a motion prepared here. I move to approve the project title Pine Point Grill proposed by A&E Holdings as depicted on the materials provided by the applicant dated 4-12-19 with the following findings and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to utilize the outdoor patio on their property for a seasonal outdoor sit-down table service. Accordingly, the applicant is proposing to increase the parking by providing additional spaces at the Blue Point Congregational Church located next door to meet the off-street parking requirements set forth in the zoning ordinance. The property is located within the residential R2 zoning district and is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map U25, lot 16. 
The planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization, layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions. 1. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A. Revise the parking information matrix to include the amount of parking spaces needed for any customer standing slash waiting area. B. Provide some wayfinding signage directing patrons to use the sidewalk along the Pine Point Road as access to the restaurant. C. Paint a crosswalk across Bradford Lane to provide for safer experience for pedestrians. D. Coordinate with the Scarborough Sanitary District in regards to the increased capacity given the proposed expansion of the restaurant services. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second and a motion. Any discussion? All in favor. Show that as unanimous. Good luck to you. Thank you. Hope very you have much. a great summer. Have a great day. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have my light on. It's on now. I didn't have it on when I did my second. <laughs> this technology is getting to me. Yeah. <clears throat> Next item tonight, State Manufactured Homes, Inc. requests a site plan amendment for 126 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map R076, Lot 7. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project is located in the Industrial Zoning District uh, within the existing Hillcrest community. As you may recall, this applicant was also before the board uh, for an advisory opinion uh, in March as part of the applicant's miscellaneous appeal to the zoning board. The Zoning Board did grant approval in April and is before the Board this evening for a Site Plan Amendment Review for a proposed 3,000 square foot <coughs> building addition to the existing Hillcrest Community Building. So given that the proposed land use is not defined in the town's off-street parking requirements, the number of parking spaces shall be determined uh, by the Planning Board based on the nature of the site, the intensity of, of the use, and the parking demand expected. The applicant has provided some information specific to the proposed parking on the site and has noted that the existing parking is adequate for the proposed expansion. Uh, so this evening, the board will need to determine if the amount of parking spaces proposed is adequate based on the information provided. Staff would also like to point out that the proposed expansion appears to be located in close proximity to the wetlands and vernal pool on the property. Staff questions of any adverse impacts, uh, impacts to these natural resources will occur uh, due to the proposed development. The applicant should uh, discuss this with the board this evening. Staff has also suggested that the applicant uh, provide additional pedestrian infrastructure on the site, given that the applicant has noted that most of the building's users walk to the community center from the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, the board should provide direction on this element this evening. These are the main elements for the board to review. Uh, there are a number of other uh, staff comments provided, um, but these can be re reviewed administratively if the board uh, is comfortable with that approach. Thank you. Thank you, Jamel. If we could have the applicant please approach. Good evening, Andy Morris, Morris civil, en I'm sorry, civil engineer from BH2M. Uh, also with me is the owners from State Manufactured Homes. Uh, Jamal did a good job introducing the project. I'm going to try to be uh, brief here. Uh, so the, the existing community center that's on site was, was built around 1992. <coughs> At that time there were approximately 165 units in the Hillcrest community. Uh, today, they're currently approved for, I believe, 335 units. So the existing community center is just too small to accommodate the facility. Uh, that's why we're here. Looking for a, a little over 3,000 square foot addition. Uh, I'm going to try to touch on some of the items uh, Jamel brought up and kind of open up the discussion here on these items. Uh, parking. The, um, I tried to spell it out in our cover letter uh, to you guys as part of this application, but the community center serves the Hillcrest community solely, doesn't serve any public use. Uh, so most of the residents walk or are transported to the community center via bus um, within the facility. To give the board some perspective, the, the furthest house from the community center is about 1,800 linear feet uh, within the Hillcrest community. Uh, there are currently 12 parking spaces that are striped at the community center. Uh, under the current configuration, the, the site can accommodate in excess of probably 24 parking spots. 
Uh, people also park along the edge of the building as it sits today. Uh, I believe the applicants provided a schematic in your uh, documentation that has that. Um, the applicants aren't aware of any traffic issues or movement issues that have happened at this facility as a result of the current configuration. Uh, certainly the 24 parking spaces have, have not been an issue uh, to be an adequate amount for the current facility. Um, and again, the, the expansion of this facility is not going to be serving additional residents. It's still serving the same amount of people at the same uh, facility. So we don't see a, a large uptick in volume of traffic to this facility uh, as a result. Um, Stormwater from the facility, uh, the, the expansion is all being collected off the roof, dumped into a DEP approved drip edge uh, where the, the runoff is treated and ultimately discharged to the wetlands uh, that abut the property. Um, I'm going to try to go down a couple of, of the, the comments here. Um, parking I just hit on, but uh, I, the applicants are willing to do some minor striping adjustments at the building to accommodate pedestrian uh, movement. We're anxious to kind of have that discussion with the board to see what you guys would be looking for. Um, wetland impacts. Uh, the actual footprint and size of this building has been designed around protecting the wetlands. Uh, if you remember, we previously had a, a much larger addition proposed at this location. We've kind of uh, scaled things back and, and the, the whole intent of the design is to try to protect these wetlands and, and not have any impacts to them. Uh, so certainly that's a, a big aspect of the design and, and configuration of this. Um, all of the appropriate erosion control measures are all spelled out on the plans, uh, as the board is aware. Uh, landscaping. Um, the current facility has no landscaping. It's a community center in the middle of the community, Hillcrest community that serves that. Um, there is a grassed island out in front. The applicants would prefer to keep that um, as a grassed island if the board would support that to allow for snow storage. But again, we'd like to discuss that with you this evening. Um, lighting of the building will be handled will be handled with wall packs on the on the proposed building. Uh, the only other issue I wanted to bring up was sprinklers. Um, I know the applicants have uh, architect Joe Delaney has worked with the state fire marshal to get the fire marshal permit not requiring sprinklers, and I, I believe the town chief, the fire chief has been involved in that, and I believe all in agreement that a uh, sprinkling of this building is not required. So with that, I throw it back to the board and happy to answer any questions. Would you guys like to add anything? Good evening, I'm Teresa DeFossis. I'm one of the owners of State Manufactured Homes. Uh, we've been in business in Scarborough since 1944. Not me, thank God, but my parents. And my, grand, my daughter and grandson are also in our business, as well as my son-in-law. We have most of the, or all of the people in the audience are our residents. We're happy that they came out tonight, I assume, and just supported this. And we'll answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, we do have opportunity for public comment this evening. So if you are here to speak on this project, we're going to same rules apply. You can keep it to four minutes. Get a nice polite tap at about three minutes and 30 seconds, which means it's time for you to wrap it up. Yeah. Thank you. Just Chairman, uh, members of the Scarborough Planning Board, uh, my name is Marie McCammon, and I live in the Hillcrest Retirement Community. And I've been a resident of Scarborough for over 30 years and lived in both of the state manufactured home communities. And the original community, uh, like he just said, was built about 30 years ago. And, and the size of the community has about tripled since then. Uh, so the reason for this addition to the community center is, is not for financial gain for state manufactured homes or to sell more homes as they are in their final stage of development. And they feel a need to put an addition on the community center to give back to their residents to give them more access and adequate room for activities, exercise, dinners, meetings, and socializing, make a more well-balanced and healthy experience as the numbers of the residents have increased so much since uh, the early 1990s. So, um, so please consider what State Manufacturing Homes is trying to do, uh, not for themselves personally, but to give Scarborough seniors adequate room 
and parking, I guess, first I heard about parking, to have a more complete and healthy senior living experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else here like to get up and speak on this topic? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment, turn this over to the board. Um, Jen, do you want to start this one off? Sure. Um, I am curious um, what the um, size of the spaces are that you're proposing on um, your sketch plan. <clears throat> And along with that, so not just uh, the, the space size, but the aisle width. <clears throat> Are you, you're talking on the existing uh, parking lot? Um, this is on concept plan sheet number one with the hand, the spaces that have that are hand drawn in. Um, so I, I believe what that's a sketch of this. Uh, you know what's up on the board here. Uh, you've got. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood between 45 and 55 feet across that parking lot that, that exists in front of the building, depending on where you are in front of that. The striping that's currently out there is, is 9 by 18 striping, and it's along the uh, Hillcrest Avenue portion of, of the site, so kind of not up to, against the building but away from the building. There's currently 12 spaces striped in there. I think there's spaces one through 12 on that schematic you're looking at. And is that your, it's your intent to have the same size spaces stripe? Your, your intent is to stripe all of these spaces, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. that is their intent, yes. And they would be 9 by 18 as well. 9 by 18, and the aisle yep. widths between the two, do you know that you can get two, so 18 feet of parking? depth plus whatever your aisle width is. Right. I, I haven't laid that onto our site plan. That's certainly something um, we intend to do, mm -hmm. um, and I can provide you with that information. So I, 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 don't, I don't have that to give you Okay, tonight. sure. I just wasn't it'll, it'll sure. Vary, it'll vary as you go across the parking lot because of the, the depth. Because you're working with your existing. Understood. Yep. I just yep. wanted to make sure that if you're, you're showing 24 spaces here, um, <clears throat> just curious to make sure they were all the same size. Right. No, we're going to make them all nine by eighteen. We're going to maximize as, as many spaces as we can get in the existing uh, in the existing area. Make sure all traffic movement perfect. You know, movements work and, and are safe. Okay. And then um, to follow up on one of the staff comments about um, pedestrian activity, I think it's terrific that you have that you don't feel that you need to greatly increase your. Um, parking lot because so many of your residents walk to events here. Um, just looking through, I'm not um, intimately familiar with this uh, neighborhood, but it appears from Google anyway that there's not a, ne a network of sidewalks here, so presumably people are walking in the street, um, which should be fine if, you're, if your traffic volumes are low enough, but I'm curious if you had given any thought to how that might interact with the parking lot layout and the entrance to the new building or addition sorry so your your concern is how people get from Hillcrest Avenue to the building is that is that right yeah um, I think that's one of the things Jamal was hinting at in his his memo um, is whether we want to do some striping in front of the building to allow a pedestrian walkway in between some of those spaces along the along the building. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. I think the applicants are more than willing to do that. Um, how we get them from the parking along the building to the other side, I guess I'd look to the board to see what they'd be what they'd be interested in there. Sure. Um, I mean, we could talk about it. I was just curious if you had, if, if this was, if you had a thought on that or not, or if you were looking to the board to, to weigh in. Of course. Hi, we're just having a little sidebar over here. My name's Tina Smith. I am from State Manufactured Homes, also a lifetime Scarborough resident. Um, just wanted to add our Hillcrest Avenue, if you're not familiar with our community, um, is 75 feet wide because we move manufactured homes in and out of our community a lot. So they're um, designed 
Um, my husband has a big toter, and um, it may be up to up, uh, some of the units that he pulls with the with the toter included are um, up to 100 feet long. So um, we definitely can move people very safely. We have people walking from Maine Medical Center a lot on their lunch breaks, mm -hmm. and they hook up with the Eastern Trail system that's in the back of our community. So it's all very walkable and safe. Yeah. And everybody goes 15 miles an hour, right, guys? Yes. <laughs> Anything else, Chad? No, no, that's no. all. Rick, uh, Manking. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that you wouldn't. Oh, let's use a technology here. <laughs> Um, that this doesn't need to be sprinkled. Uh, am I reading your notes wrong or something? It says that uh, it appears the entire building is to be sprinkled and most likely a fire alarm upgrade. That's uh, staff's understanding from the fire department. Um, so we'd ask the applicant to coordinate with them um, to just make sure it's the way it should be. Okay, because I just heard, heard conversation saying it didn't need it and want to make sure you don't get yourself in trouble. Um, we, we can touch on that a little more. Okay. Good evening. My name is Jacob Smith. I'm uh, uh, <laughs> Tina Marie's uh, son. So um, we have been in communication with the state fire marshal and the uh, also town fire marshal. I forget his name now. But um, he says that we don't have to have uh, sprinklers. Um, he set an occupancy cap um, up to, I think, 220 people. In the proposed expansion and 300 in the total building, and that's for uh, non sprinkling systems. Okay. You have a memo that will, you have a memo or something in writing yes, you could submit to planning at some point? Yep, we can. Thank, thank you. Okay, thanks. Rick. Um, I'd just like to say I am familiar with this community and it's a wonderful place. Okay. Yeah, um, and your submittals is complete so um, and I am very impressed by the number of people that you brought with you <laughs> so I'm gonna vote for this one to see um, yeah I, I think I've seldom see people drive through there mostly they are walking and I think everybody but the nice lady in the back there drives fairly slow so <laughs> Uh, I think it's fine, and uh, I'm going to vote for it, so just so you know. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, um, I reiterate some concerns about the parking. Uh, I did receive, and so did uh, Roger, received a wonderful letter from Steffi Cox about the work you folks do there, um, and we pass that on to the, the rest of the board. Uh, so it has been entered into the, into the record. Uh, the problem, sometimes what happens when people start to praise an area, or praise a, a development, is they then they raise an issue. And one of the issues that was raised as a result of this letter is the number of people who actually end up coming from outside upon occasion to the, um, to the facility. And to me, that simply uh, reinforces the idea that there would be people from the outside uh, coming in, and you really do need the, to assure the safety of those people who are not familiar with the way your uh, project works, with the way your, your homes work there. So that um, we, do need, uh, we do need some good pedestrian ways and some pedestrian uh, connect, uh, co excuse me, directions. Uh, the staff also noted a question about the vernal pools and the wetlands delineation, and when was the last time that was done? It was, it was in 2017. Um, we have a letter from, um, I can't even think, the, the DEP, okay. the Vernal Pool just, people, <laughs> that said that, it, uh, yeah, Albert Frick, um, Frick did that um, study for us and said that it wasn't an issue, so they were good with that. And Steffi was mentioning about the Scarborough G Garden Club. There's a lot of our, mem our, a lot of our residents are members of the Scarborough Garden Club, so they um, they meet at our facility because of the residents that live in our community. They are allowed to use the facilities mm -hmm. um, whenever they want to on their own, and 
we have a garden that um, we grow vegetables for the Scarborough Food Pantry and for um, area people that are in need. So you make quite a contribution to oh, the community. Thanks. thanks. We, we're yeah. proud to be part of our, our town. Uh, let me ask you: Is with the expansion of the facility, is there going to be any increase in staffing, which would enter into the number of parking spaces you might need? So um, currently, we have 19 um, full-time year-round employees that work for um, my mom and um, my family, and um, there is no plan to expand that. We have a program director who um, multitasks a lot, and I pick up the slack. So. Um, he drives the bus and does the programming, so we handle handle things. Where, where do quite they well. park? So um, the people that the people that live in our community park at their homes, or if they need, if they're uh, if they can't. Oh, where do the employees park? Well, yes, sorry. yes. So we have a big sales center up at the top of the community, which is okay. um, located right next to Maine Medical's cancer center. We have a, a pretty extensive um, parking area that would. Um, the, uh, where they all park. So, so basically, the the parking area that you're proposing is only for residents and visitors, and not for staff. Right. The staff park at the office. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I keep a tight thumb on that all the time. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Robin. Yeah, I'm obviously living in the wrong neighborhood. So <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good at Hillcrest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think that uh, there's a little uh, work to do here, um, but in general, I think you are headed in the in the right direction. Um, this is the beauty of going last. Uh, everyone has pretty much asked the questions that I was going to, but I guess you know my question is just for. Uh, your engineer in understanding the process and that are you okay with staff comments moving forward kind of a thing with this the parking and providing you know I know that we got the the wetlands report here but whatever information is needed kind of a thing are you in yeah, general I, mean, I, think, I think most of the comments were, were pretty minor in nature Good. I think they're easily okay. uh, easily addressed to, to me you know uh, any guidance the board wanted to give us on on pedestrian striping mm -hmm. or, or access yeah. Give us some direction on that, and, and we can uh, okay. we can make that happen. Yeah, sounds good. And so then my next question is for staff: Is there something that we need to weigh on, in on, or are you going to walk us through that, Nick? Or at, where we're just we're not really at a vote. Uh, we're not really at a point to vote. We're just I, yeah. I think there's some more plan cleanup that needs to happen. Agreed. Uh, yep. We just received that for yep. a pool study like right now so yeah. I think on the next submission yeah. that will all be included yeah. the plan gets cleaned up we'll probably yeah. see some striping some pedestrian yeah. ways and hopefully these people don't have to sit here for three hours like I did tonight thank you would, Th thank you Robin acceptable not knowing the whole process or anything if we agree to whatever you want for striping or parking or whatever the problem that we have is we have um, a construction crew like ready to go and and if we had to wait another month or so it might um, might not work as great as it could if, and keep the cost as low as we possibly could I think if it's minor stuff we definitely could be agreeable to just agree to whatever you want for you know stripes or yellow white whatever you want yeah I wish it was as simple as just some yeah. striping but um, especially with that vernal pool study and things like that we haven't had enough chance to review that portion of this oh. Um, so I think, I think when you come back, this is going to be relatively easy to get through once we review the full information and see the plans, okay. give staff as much time as you can with it. Um, certainly appreciate your willingness to work with the staff as closely as you are. Um, but I also caution you, don't ever agree to something you haven't seen yet. <laughs> because <laughs> I know these guys. No, I'm just kidding. doesn't sound like it's anything that's major, so we could do, we could do it. And yeah, um, you know, of course, we're always sensitive to applicants construction. We, we really try to be, but in this situation, I feel like there definitely needs to be more information that's um, shared with this board and with staff for us to get to the point where we're going to be comfortable to get you on to that next phase and seeing you build something great. So um, I'm just going to keep, we didn't get Roger on this one. <laughs> I don't think I forgot. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of questions. Uh, is Hillcrest Avenue, is that a public street or is that, you, um, you folks own it? 
All of the roads at Hillcrest are private. Okay. Um, so we maintain them with our own plow trucks, and we even pick up our own trash. So um, we, we do everything in-house, other okay. than the police and fire. Okay. Rescue. And and the other thing I wanted to ask is, um, in your cover letter here, you, you mentioned the residents of Hillcrest and Pinecrest. So we have another community um, called Pinecrest, which is down... Um, Oh, is that about the one down a by the mile from, Volvo? from our other facility? Um, I would say, I'm looking, I'm looking here, I don't see anybody from Jean Cox. Oh, oh, yeah, Jean and Herbie Hughes in the back. Those are our two Pinecrest residents that are here tonight. Um, they certainly are welcome to join all of our activities at, um, at Hillcrest at the community center because we just don't have a, a community center at Pinecrest um, yet. We might do it someday, but. Um, so if if they come to stuff, it's typically on the bus, or okay. um, or they you know if people carpool a lot. Everybody knows that it's kind of like a it's a smaller facility, a smaller area right now. So everybody works together, and they don't, like these three ladies all rode the same car here. That's what they do when they go to the community center. What, what about the um, the homes, the relatively newer homes that that are down back? Are they all part of this whole? Yes, um, yeah, that was our um, expansion um, back. We started in 2003, and we're just now finishing phase four, and we still have two homes left, Roger. And those those people would, <laughs> would tend those people would tend to walk. Yeah, everybody kind of they either walk or if they're if they're it, really um, not feeling well, then they drive. But they, you know, they ride together in groups rather than everybody taking their own car. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Roger. So um, with that said, I think you've got some pretty good feedback to work with. Yep. Again, work through this uh, list from the staff comments, get that plan submission together, and hopefully we'll see you back in three weeks. Okay. In the meantime, everyone that showed up tonight, I want to say thank you and that you should honestly have a discussion with your owners about what a fun night out looks like. <laughs> All right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I was going to say, I hope I promised you something better than this afterwards. <laughs> Thank, thank you again. You guys were a great audience. Uh, that's determined on submission time. But, uh, thank you again. Folks, we still have a couple items left on our agenda, so if you could carry your conversations out to the hall and try to be as quiet as possible, we'd really appreciate it. We have two more items this evening, and we have about 35 minutes to get through them before we stop taking new business. So the next applicant would be so kind to try to be as brief in their application introduction as possible. We'd love to get the entire agenda heard this evening since these people have been sitting here for three hours. So next up. We have F9 Properties, LLC, request a site plan amendment for 374 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 45. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project is located in the B3 zoning district along Route 1, and a portion of the site is located in the, within the Stream Protection Overlay District. Uh, this is the former site of Atler, Atlas Fireworks. The applicant's proposing to renovate the existing building on the property and construct a 960-square-foot accessory storage building uh, for their proposed retail use. The zoning ordinance requires a 15-foot-wide planted buffer strip along the site's Route 1 frontage. Given the challenging layout of the site, the buffer strip is proposed uh, within the Route 1 right-of-way. While the zoning standard seeks to have the buffer strip maintained along the front property line, it does allow for the board to approve an alternative, alternative treatment. Staff is comfortable with this approach, given that the proposal appears to improve the streetscape <coughs> along Route 1. Uh, staff does recommend that the applicant provide additional deciduous trees within the buffer uh, to meet the site plan review standards. <coughs> the applicant's proposing to eliminate a curb cut and maintain, a southerly, maintain the southerly driveway along Route 1. Uh, staff recommends that the applicant narrow down the driveway to the required 
width of 26 to 30 feet as this could result in safer turning movements entering and exiting the site. This would also allow for a more robust buffer strip. And now I'll uh, ask Angela Blanchett, our town engineer, to speak on the proposed stormwater design. Thanks. Um, one of the things I just wanted to have, uh, have you guys discuss with the applicant was um, the stormwater piece, just because uh, typically with a redevelopment site like this, um, we look to, to try to get some water quality benefit out of it as they're pulling up pavement, repaving. Um, and so I know the applicant is suggesting at this site that they are reducing the impervious area and it's not really clear to staff um, the areas that are coming out and, and how that balances because it appears that some large grass area in the back is actually being paved and where the build, new building will be going. So there's some questions surrounding that um, where the um, they're improving the site, but typically for a site like this, we would ask for some water quality treatment. I, I think as an example, um, Martin's Point, we, we typically ask for 50%. The board has been pretty consistent with that. However, this is a challenging site. There's not a whole lot of room once you get the parking in there. And so um, our next step is typically look at what's practical on the site. And so you start looking at where um, the <coughs> runoff leaves the paved surfaces, are there opportunities to add some sort of filter or um, some treatment benefit um, just where you're so close to the stream um, in this situation. So it just be something that the board should, should talk to the applicant with, I think, and see what, what is possible. Thank you, Angela. Anything else, Jamal? Uh, no, no thanks. All, all set. Applicant, I would like to sh please introduce the project. Good evening, Indy Morrill from uh, BH2M here representing F9 Properties. Uh, I will try to be brief uh, here because I think, again, there's quite a few minor issues on this project. Um, a couple of the issues I think we need to work through is parking. Uh, currently there's 15 spaces proposed on the parcel. Um, I think um, we need to find a way to get to 17 uh, parking spaces on the site. Um, as Angela mentioned, this is a real, a real tight site, so we're, we're trying to, to make this all work uh, for the applicants. Um, the applicant has no problem reducing what we did for the... Uh, so there's two curb cuts to the site. There's one existing driveway on the left-hand side of the building if you're on Route 1 looking at the building. Uh, that curb cut's being eliminated. Uh, what we did for the entrance on the other side of the parcel was just held the existing entrance. Uh, the applicant's more than happy to reduce that to the 26 to 30 feet uh, as Jamel had requested. Um, Uh, connect, uh, one of the other items mentioned, which I'd like to discuss with the board tonight, was uh, to get some clear direction from the board is uh, connection to the abutting parcel. There's a, a bowling alley uh, that abuts this. There was some comment on whether we should connect interior parking lots from this parking lot to that parking lot. Um, parking is at a, at a premium on this site. I think a connection there is going to eliminate probably three parking spaces, which is... Uh, going to be difficult uh, for this site to, to make that work, so I'd request any input from the board on that uh, as we move forward. Uh, all the other comments that were in, in the memo, I think, were, um, are things we can work out as we move forward. With that, I throw it back to the board. All right, thank you. Now, there's an opportunity for our public comment on this project. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this topic? Please approach the podium. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Um, Rachel, do you want to start this one off? Uh, yeah. almost forgot to turn that on. Yes. Um, one note uh, that I have, or a note that I have on the parking, is I note that you have three spaces, I believe it's three, designated as staff parking on one side of the, the building. Correct. Um, the ordinances do ask every, that uh, provide guidelines that no parking should actually 
uh, in a sense, be to the front of the building. Now, I am in sympathy with the problems that you have with enough parking there, uh, but what I would like to see is uh, some uh, beefed up buffering, uh, beefed up landscaping, to really uh, try to hide those parking spaces from the road. I notice also that you do not have street trees. Uh, you do have the white spruce listed. I don't believe you have any other street trees scheduled on here. I don't uh, so, no. And uh, in terms of the complete street uh, that Scarborough has, uh, we need to see some good street trees in there. So you have an opportunity to add that by the narrowing of that driveway. Correct. The other thing um, that I want to bring up is that uh, one of the things uh, in terms of architecture and the design standards, the, the renovations to existing buildings, uh, according to our, our guidelines, shall complement or match the materials, form, color, and detailing of the original structure. Renovations shall retain any distinctive architectural features or examples of skilled craftsmanship. I notice that you've already uh, demoed the porch, which would be the distinctive architectural feature uh, before we've had a chance to discuss whether we wanted that to remain. Do you have a comment? Yeah, the, the, I believe the applicant removed the front 10 feet of the building. He removed the porch. Yes, correct. And according to our guidelines uh, and design standards, renovation shall retain any distinctive architectural features and it's been pulled down, the distinctive architectural feature. Do you have a comment beyond the fact that it's already gone? I do not. I see. That's enough. Thank you. Robin? I thought I was going to get through an entire night without talking about stormwater. You were but close. You were close. close. Um, yeah, so can you just refresh refresh my memory? Um, which, you know, like I'm um, looking at, what, what watershed are you in? Do you know? Because uh, I forget how far down this is on Route 1. What is the name of the stream? Um, the, the, the stream is in the right back left corner of this uh, okay. site. Okay. The name of it escapes me. I don't think it has a name. Is Maybe that's Willow why it escapes me. Is it either Willowdale or Mill? No, it drains to Mill. It drains yeah, I, think that's the okay. I think it's an unnamed and tributary, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so can can you talk a little bit about the stormwater, where where it's yes. going and what you're doing with it? Yes. Uh, I meant to touch on something that Angela had mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, moving forward with the plans, we'll make it more clear what's being eliminated for impervious area. The majority of what's being eliminated for impervious area is to the bowling alley side of the existing parking lot. Okay. So the, the proposed parking, the existing parking lot goes up to the property line, so where we've got that vegetated ditch, yeah, right there. That's all currently paved up to the edge. Um, mm -hmm. So from an existing point of view, basically the entire site is flowing to the stream in the back. Okay. Um, are, are you planning to control it with just grading, or is we, it We have to... sheet flowed basically the entire parking lot Mm -hmm. uh, to the back, kind of okay. between the storage building and the existing building, if okay. you will. Uh, there's also a vegetated ditch on the uh, along the side of the parking lot. Which what's your up, what's your setback to the stream there? Uh, the, we're we're showing the 75 foot setback, which goes through the kind of middle of the existing okay. building. See that dashed line? That's the 75 yep. foot setback. Okay. Yep. I would really, I'd strongly encourage you to. To rethink, you know, just if if a level lip spreader might be needed, and um, you know, I I'm we could we could easily put a level spreader yeah. behind the proposed storage building. And again, I'm not trying to dictate the means and methods kind of a thing. Right. I think it's just uh, important right. to to maintain as much sheet flow as possible. Um, remind me, is this is this parking lot paved or is it primarily gravel? Existing. Yeah. It's paved. Okay, it yeah. is paved. Yeah. Okay, I can't. 
I'm get, I think I'm getting it confused with the old antiques place. I can't. It's the old um, fireworks. fireworks place. Okay, yeah. so it's further down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think there's a, a bit more work that, that's needed here, um, but uh, I think also when you're talking about removing impervious area, it's important to understand that um, if you are removing it, that to, to just remember that there's some, if you wanna use it as treatment, really it's meant to not only just rip up the pavement, but to also rototill and make sure that there is some percol percolation that's happening kind of a thing. And yep. there's some good standards and BMPs out there for, for that kind of a thing. And, Great. and I have no doubt that you'll work with staff to, to take care of um, stormwater. And um, as you had mentioned, there's also some parking sort of challenges or there are, yes. spacing challenges and, yep. and the like. And um, are you in general agreement, like you had said with the, the staff comments, you feel like you've got enough guidance to move forward in the right direction? I, I believe so. One item to kind of bounce back to the board, to, um, the drive aisle width is required to be 24 feet in town, mm -hmm. uh, or 25 feet, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We've shown it as 24. Okay. Um, from a amount of pavement point of view, the applicant would be interested in seeing if the board would consider granting a waiver for that. Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't, um, we'd like to know that moving forward because that's going to have an impact yeah. on our stormwater. I, I think we just got to you know, like do the geometry here and see yep. what we come up with. But, yep. you know, in the in these instances, a lot of times we rely on the, the staff to yep. provide the guidance needed. So okay. um, I wish you well and yep. um, I'll pass. Thanks, Robin. Roger. Sure. Um, I, I congratulate whoever is doing this with this building because <clears throat> it's a um, it, whatever is going to be done is going to be an improvement to what's there now. So I um, I would not I, I understand what the material standards are and the design, design standards, but I'm not sure I would necessarily abide by what's there now in terms of trying to make something similar to what's there. Any, anything that can be improved would be, um, would be beneficial. So um, regarding the uh, drive width, if you need to know something about the 24-foot, the, um, I have no problem with that as a waiver. Um, the only thing I would suggest um, is try and do something um, along that, um, you know, in the front of the building in terms of landscaping. Mm -hmm. To enhance that as much as possible. I mean, this is an opportunity to take a real, you know, not a very attractive site, and really turn it into something that's much more presentable. I know when we we're talking with um, before when we we're dealing with the uh, the old cliffs site, that was very challenging. So whatever we can do to enhance this and make this workable for you, I think we should. I mean, I'm one, one member who's willing to try and do whatever we can to um, help you along on this. Thank you. I'm all set. Thank you, Roger. Mm -hmm. Jen? Um, <clears throat> I, um, I think it's great that you're willing to narrow that driveway. I think unless you can provide an auto turn or other exhibit justifying a a, an opening of that width that um, something closer to our standard would be probably better served um, for everyone. I also just generally think that narrowing that driveway would align better with the parking layout that you already have um, intended. However, I recognize that you're, you're just um, currently proposing keeping the current curb width, but I think if you were willing to close that up, it serves dual purpose in making the entrance safer and providing some more space um, for landscaping. Um, I, uh, I have no idea how you'll fit two more parking spaces in there. That's sort of a fun challenge. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I wonder if, um, you know, I don't know too much about the proposed hours of operation for the business that's heading here. Um, but wonder if, the, and you know, uh, you spoke to 
the idea that a cross connection to a neighboring property would present a loss of some parking spaces, which I understand. However, they have a lot of parking spaces over there. So I, I'm not sure if there's any opportunity for, you know, some sort of agreement there for, for sharing parking. We saw earlier this evening um, how that can work out really well for um, neighbors if uses are compatible and not everybody needs the parking at the same time. That, maybe that's the case here, maybe not. Um, but that might be the way that you fit two exercises on your site is to not have them on your site. Certainly worth looking into. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, those are those are the biggest comments that I have. Yeah. I think the landscaping is good that you're I'm, um, the plan submitted. I think it's you know sort of to Roger's point that um, I think some greening up of this site will will go a long way. Thanks, Jen. Rick? Um, I don't have much to add. Um, it is going to be a challenge. Um, I think uh, I'll go along with Roger. I, I applaud anybody that wants to start pounding nails in, in that and try to put lipstick on a pig, so to speak. Um, it's been an eyesore for a while, and uh, um, hopefully it'll uh, add to the Route 1. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Rick? Uh, I have nothing other than the good luck. Mm -hmm. Looks good. Certainly the applicant's intent is to improve this site and, and make it look mm -hmm. a lot nicer. Okay. So uh, that said, um, I think, you know, beefing up your stormwater, making sure that uh, you really are doing a, a solid job considering where you're located next to the, the uh, stream there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as parking spaces to go, this might be a question for staff. Um, I, I think the 17 is being triggered by a requirement based on use. Is that correct? And yeah, correct. If that is correct, then does this board have any authority to waive the number of parking spaces if the applicant can show that the use of the property wouldn't typically require that number of spaces? I believe in the site plan ordinance, it allows for uh, the applicant to request lesser parking spaces, but they'd still have to provide um, space for it to be built if needed. Correct me if I'm wrong, staff. You get it right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think... Or I, I guess the only other thing I would, I would offer is there is the other approach like we saw with the um, Pine Point Grill um, and their coordination with the church. If they're could be some type of discussion with the, as I think Ms. Ladd was pointing out, the uh, bowling alley. And, um, maybe there's some arrangement they can make there, but otherwise they would still need to basically demonstrate they could fully build out what they need, but not actually have to be able to build it at the outset. But if it turns out that ultimately they need it, our code officer would have the ability to basically say, okay, you're not you're not meeting your needs on site now you need to build those other site spots out so to, thank you to kind of give the board some some input on this we, we looked at it pretty hard today i think i can fit two more spaces on the site um i guess that's the conversation i need to have with with our clients is is you know um do they want to build those now or would they rather hmm. leave them as you know potential future spaces i think there'd be one more in the front to the side of the building and then one more by the dumpster uh, in the back, reconfiguring that parking striping. Okay. And then, um, you know, so it seems like you have a lot of cleanup kind of to do. So your next submission, I expect, will probably be a bit more tied together and yep. uh, complete. And I, I think, um, you know, whether it's presented to this board uh, at a meeting or whatnot, I think, I think it would be benefit you to get us a better answer on that front deck. Uh, just for the knowledge of this board as to how that decision came about and whether it was done through proper channels and whatnot. Okay. Sure. I'll be happy to talk to the applicant and uh, include that in our submission back to you. Thank you. Sure. All right. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you. Very much. And our final item of the evening, Michael Scammon requests a sketch plan review for 39 Ingleside.
Did I say that right? Drive Assessor's Map RO50 Lot 024. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project's located in the High Guest Parkway District. Uh, it shares the same driveway as the salt pump uh, climbing gym. So the applicant's proposing a phase development that includes a wellness center uh, in phase one of the project. And just a reminder for the board that a sketch plan review is the opportunity for the board and the applicant to have a high level conversation about the proposal. So a few comments. Uh, staff would like to note that the maximum amount of residential uses cannot exceed 40% of the non-residential uses at full build-out, so the applicant should refer to the zoning ordinance uh, for more guidance on that. Staff would also like to point out that since this property consists of over five acres of land, the project will need to be reviewed as a planned development. Um, so this, this that includes a three-step review process uh, with the board, uh, so the applicant should refer to the zoning ordinance uh, when preparing for future submissions. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, it's the applicant. The zoning standards also require all planned developments within the district to provide for a walkable, pedestrian-oriented design, coordinated building architecture, and open space and conservation. At this point, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The applicant, please introduce your, yourself and the project. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bob Metcalf. I'm with Mitchell and Associates for Landscape Architects and Land Planners. And, uh, here on behalf of Michael Scammon and his daughter Mel and his son-in-law Ash and then George Workman from my office is here also. I get myself all squared up here. <coughs> Probably should have set this thing up earlier. Hmm. Essentially what we're here tonight to do is to go over uh, the master plan and the first phase uh, development for what is going to be called Totem Pond, which is the gravel air pond area off of the Higgins Parkway. Uh, the address for it is 39 Ingleside Drive. Uh, and as Jamal said, it's right, it shares the same entranceway that goes into the uh, salt pond climbing. And I think this thing took it back. I do have the plan on my computer if you want to well, yeah. switch back. Just had to say something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you did. Last time I did this, when I set up my laptop, had it running, and I plugged it in, it wouldn't operate, so. <laughs> you folks had quite a crowd tonight. Okay, here we go, it's starting to run. Uh, as I indicated, this is gonna be called Totem Pond. Uh, the property uh, is 48 plus acres, uh, of which also on part of this is, there we go. This is the existing uh, site conditions. Uh, it's a 48 acre parcel of uh, which also Mr. Scammon has a existing residence that's a parcel that encompasses this area along here, which is 3.9 acres. Mm -hmm. As 
going backwards too quickly. Uh, essentially, this is the where the access comes in to serve the rock climbing gym. This is where the access road, uh, gravel access way comes in right now into the core of the uh, was the gravel operation. Hey, George. Would you, which, yeah, 15 seconds. Would you just, would you mind giving me an assistance over here to keep this thing from jumping on me? Excuse me. Uh, that the uh, gravel access way comes into the middle core of the site. Ingleside Road comes along the side here to come back towards the, uh, don't do dissolve. Okay. Uh, as I indicated, uh, there are several ponds on here. There are five different existing ponds on here. There was a result of the gravel operation. Uh, there is a 50 foot wide right of way that. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties going on here. So there's a 50 foot wide access easement uh, right of way that comes across and comes back over towards Two Rod Road. And then there's also a section in here. Uh, for Ingleside to continue on through. Uh, push that back up. Yeah, and then uh, there are two, uh, there are three existing residential lots here, and there's a house here uh, that have access off of uh, this portion right away. It's a gravel access way now. There's an existing gravel tow road that actually runs along through, through here back towards the core of the site. You can go ahead and step to the other one. Yep. As you can tell from this aerial, a good portion of the site is currently wooded. There's obviously the pond areas, there's some excavation from sand and gravel in this location in here. There's an existing beach area in here and a pavilion. And sorry for this. And uh, gravel access way coming in through here. Uh, all the ponds uh, are fairly deep. Uh, this one in here is a mineral-based pond. Uh, as I said, the house is back up in its location in here. There's an existing cemetery on the site located roughly up in this area. Where did I just look? I saw up in this area in here. So what we're looking at is an overall master plan for this site, and the concept is to make it a wellness community. Uh, we're looking at uh, the ability to create an environment that's a healthy living, also a clinical uh, health awareness, uh, and uh, uh, community type environment. I'm going to have you go to the master plan if you would. Just hold it. So, the overall spatial concept for this property is. This line here is roughly where the lot line, the zone line is between the Haggis Parkway uh, district, and then this is in the uh, rural residential and farming. So what we've looked at on this site is to look at three potential lots that may be developed in the future. Uh, again, this is again looking at this as an overall long-term type of master plan. The inevitability of this happening right now is more in the long distance uh, approach and that the access or continuation of Ingleside would continue through here uh, to provide access to these three lots in here and this road would not continue on as a, as a functioning road. If the master plan development area really is confined to this area of the site which would be for the wellness community leaving the residential lot out of the, uh, the equation. So that the first phase for the wellness would be this development in this location in here, which is going to be a wellness cafe, wellness type medical related uses, an event center. Uh, future phases would be for commercial related to wellness uh, one phase may very well be some recreational use in terms of fields. That's part of the long range goal for this. And then another upper area here for some expanded development uh, for commercial and again all related to wellness uh, living. This portion along this outer edge of the pond is being considered to be 
like wellness community in terms of cottages for people who may be coming for events at the, the facility who would have the ability to stay uh, on an evening basis or a weekend. Uh, but that's a future program, so the actual program full development has not been fully explored at this point, but just an overall concept. And then what we're actually going to be coming in with, you can go to the next one. This is going to be the phase one uh, that will be coming in with the site plan to develop the, the property. Uh, this would be the wellness community uh, cafe and offices. This would be a two-story structure. It's going to be a cafe on this lower end here. And we'll have um, access to the outdoor terrace area. And we're taking advantage of the topography on this site. And this will step down to a lower area Below. Right now, there's a shallow pond that dries up. Uh, the reclaiming part of that to become uh, a uh, part of the event area. And I apologize for this going on this way. Is the uh, the building would be here? There'd be an outdoor terrace in here that would work its way down through, following along the edge of the pond, and then this would be a lawn area with expanded gardens surrounding it. Uh, and it would be a tent uh, event area. And the, uh, the intent is to incorporate all the views and take into the integrity of the ponds, preserving the, a lot of the existing vegetation that's around there and enhancing the landscape. The connectivity from this area here through that garden area would be via a pedestrian causeway that would link this area across the pond. The parking lot we've designed as a circular configuration. Uh, I know that some of the comments in terms of the geometry of this, we have checked it out in terms of the turning ability for parking for vehicles, emergency equipment coming through uh, to have access to this. We're trying to create a sense of environment in here that's kind of welcoming and friendly and not just static, typical rectangular parking lots. Uh, the whole design of this thing is to deal with an L LID, low impact development design in terms of treating stormwater, integrating subsurface uh, infiltration type systems. And I know we had an initial conversation way back with Jay and with the town manager, and we're going to be meeting with Angela at, at Jay's recommendation before to have some conversations about how we're going to be looking and addressing stormwater. As it's quite obvious by all the ponds out here, it's a gravel, gravel source, part of the uh, aquifer protection zone falls around some of the perimeter of the ponds and part of the, the building window area falls within that. So we're going to be looking at how we can actually treat the storm water uh, and collect it uh, and then discharge appropriately. Uh, the future phases that would come off of this also that is part of the design concept for the circular is that it allows for circulation. You can leave that one up. I think that will help me. So this is a <coughs> schematic preliminary concept plan. So in terms of the circulation and going into future phases, the circulation can work around, serve the access to the center core of the parking associated with the first phase, and then circulation that would continue out and around up towards the, the other portions of the site where uh, we had shown some of the residential lots. This would be that second, uh, third phases for where we might be able to have either recreational type uses and or other structures designed towards a wellness community. The cottages we were talking about along this portion of the pond, that's just kind of an example that uh, is based off of one uh, that George is familiar with, Haystack. Yeah, Haystack. Uh, and so it's kind of basically become an area for Wellness related, could be arts programs, healthy type living type of uh, or, uh, organized programs that would go on in that area. So, uh, as part of the event center, uh, part of this area in here may become overflow parking with that pedestrian connection that can go from where parking could occur to uh, help facilitate the event center itself. Right now we're trying to work with the existing infrastructure as far as roadways are concerned to develop as either pathways or to follow along and actually formalize the road network to avoid having to do much more clearing. Uh, Mr. Scammer really wants to hold the integrity of the quality of the environmental aesthetics of this property, uh, really reinforce uh, the, 
the visual character of the, the ponds themselves that add a significant attribute to this property uh, and becoming a real asset to the community itself. So I apologize for the fading in and out and trying to stay on top of this <laughs> to give you an idea of what we're trying to look at. If um, uh, the intent would be for us to actually finish our plans uh, and get those into you for submission. Uh, we'll be working with uh, the various you, the sewer department with the various utilities in terms of coordinating our utility connections, but we really wanted to kind of get in and show you in a broad brush stroke what the long-term thought process is for this property uh, and what the initial phase would be. Uh, seeing what's been happening out on Higgins Parkway, I know I did a project here on the far end of Higgins Parkway for Lynn Higgins back in the 90s and I've watched Tigers Parkway kind of sit fallow and all of a sudden it's really just hopping out there so which is kind of nice to, for the community to see that happening so and uh, I think what Mike is proposing to do here is going to be a real attribute to the community so with that uh, any questions you may have or any guidance for us in terms of thought process that uh, you would like us to entertain in addition to the items that uh, Jamal put together in his letter thank you uh, thank you very much um, <clears throat> So, you know, in general, you know, this is just a brief sketch uh, plan. I'm just going to throw this one out. I'm not going to go down the line. Uh, if anyone has anything they'd like to offer, some thoughts, uh, first one with the hand up gets to go. I just have a question. Um, sure. What's the yeah. time frame you think from start to finish on this project? And I'm just wondering. From a you mean in full build? Well, how many, you have how many total? How do you phase, how do you plan on phasing? Well, I guess right now the initial phase is what we're looking at up on here, okay. which would be this first building, the parking, yeah, uh, and then all the improvements associated around that. That's the initial phase. Okay. The timing for any of the subsequent phases and what those phases will be fine tuned. There's no time frame established at this point. Okay. This is a long-term project. It's nothing you're going to be seeing a full build-out in five to ten years. Right. I mean, and you showed us a lot to the last just trying to figure out you know, you're where, right. where you go first. Yeah. Right. So, right. Thanks. But this That's will be the good. first phase. Thanks. I'll, um, I'll just say, you know, this is a, kind of a unique property with all of the water features on it. Um, and definitely would like you to see to, you know, take advantage of those viewpoints and vistas and... Um, so and I and I also throw out that I kind of like the the unique design of it's almost a roundabout with a parking lot in the middle. I'd be interested to see how that works, um, <laughs> just traffic wise, you know. Um, but it's it's a cool design. So um, I think you know best utilizing these landscaping features, you know, is certainly to your benefit. On the residential side, um, you know, I, I noticed you have a couple two acre lots in there. Single family homes, or is this multifamily? How did you foresee that down the road being developed? That, and I'll let Mike tell me I'm wrong, but basically, we were just looking at in terms of what the zoning would allow in terms of creating potential residential lots. There is no immediate, it's because that portion of the land falls in your residential farming district that we were just showing what could occur in terms of the use of the land. That's really, that's probably the furthest end out in terms of you know utilizing the property itself but we were just doing a due diligence in terms of seeing what might be able to be developed on this site taking Mike's vision and trying to put that into context so but the residential lots have not been really defined as whether they're single family or multifamily at this point so thank you Rachel yeah I, I drive by this site every day pretty much and um, I, I really commend you for starting to think about what can go in there. Um, this is in, holds a great deal of promise, but it also, I think, you probably know that um, it also holds some real challenges. Um, how, how deep are those lakes, those ponds? Okay, Mike, I got to have to. 15 to 18 feet. I'm sorry? 15 to 18 feet. 15 to 18 feet. All right, so that raises safety questions um, for visitors uh, and uh, certainly um, the causeway over to the islands that's going to be uh, over to the phase one that's going to be quite a feat of uh, engineering 
Uh, and I know that the topography there uh, is um, very challenging. We, I have worked with uh, a developer uh, that, who developed um, a conservation area, a conservation development in an old gravel pit. And you're pretty much kind of doing the same thing, but in a much larger scale and much higher, uh, much higher elevations, I suspect. Um, so one of the issues that, that we had as we were looking at that was the stabilization of the, of the uh, sites, the stabilization of the walls around it. So I think that's going to be a challenge for you. Uh, is the event wellness center event building, is that already built? Is that already there? Oh, the, uh, the barn or the, the one down closest to your house? The pavilion. The pavilion. It was a beach pavilion. Okay, so you're going to be, at some point you're going to be adding to that. It says event pavilion. Is that? Oh, well, that's what it was used for at one time. Uh, okay, so so that's that's already that's yeah, already there, yeah, and it's going to be brought into the larger at some fashion. Uh, the larger plan. Okay. And again, that's um, the plan. <clears throat> I I I commend you for your um, your willingness to really take on what's going to be a very challenging project, but I think it holds a great deal of uh, opportunity um, for the town. Uh, and for the, the Hikus Parkway, I live up off of Scotto Hill Road, so I, as I said, I, I go past this frequently, so I'm, I am not a, an abutter, which I will make clear. Um, so the safety issues, the uh, engineering issues, the site stabilization, the transportation over the causeways, uh, and safety as you with ponds that deep as you have a lot of people wandering around, uh, that holds a lot of opportunity for accidents. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna need to really think about how you're, you're handling that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Robin? All right, I can't contain myself. I have to really commend you and tell you this is like my dream project. The fact that you're incorporating like three four, five levels of low impact development, maintaining you know the natural hydrology that, that's there and not just saying, oh yeah, I'm doing a stormwater BMP, that's LID. You're actually doing low impact development and I couldn't be more thrilled. And the whole idea that it's a wellness center, again, it's my dream. It's like a dream come true to see this come to Scarborough. So I've been known for not being like too honest after, after 10 o'clock at night, so. <laughs> So here it is on the good side. I'm being too honest, and it, this is just absolutely thrilling to see something like this as thoughtfully put together. And even just the sketch plan deliverables were just a dream to open up. I really I commend you all for what you've done so far, and this was really a, a joy to wait till 1030 to, to okay. see you all. So I look forward to seeing you all before the board. And, and to have somebody take, you know, this is my backyard, and so I want to preserve it sort of in the right way. It's just really commendable, so thank you. Thanks, Robert. <clears throat> Anyone else over here have anything to add? Roger. Um, I would uh, like to commend you also. I, I've been down there when it was the fishing hole, and um, I, I'm not sure it's, uh, do, you, do they still do? No, okay. Um, and I know it's, um, you know, the landscaping there is, is kind of unique, and you've tried to come up with different uses for it over the years, so this, this sounds very promising. And um, one thing I thought when I was looking at, the, at this sketch here is the, the property that abuts it up there beyond the wellness center, isn't that the residence at Gateway, the new apartment complex? Um, no. Way at the top, not on this side. No, road. that's this side. The apartments that are being built now? Yeah, the, 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 uh, that's on this. Yeah, the north side. Yeah, yeah. The side. yeah. Right, it'd be up here. Yeah, you're right. I'm not saying where you're pointing, so sorry. <laughs> it would be up here. I think you're yes. right, Roger. Okay. Okay. Well, just a thought I had is that, you know, you might want to think about some connectivity with that development if that's possible. Because I would, you know, that seems like it might be. The people who live there might be interested in this. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay. The uh, let's see. 
I think, I, and your entrance, the possible secondary entrance, uh, is that where your dad's house used to be? Is he talking about on the upper end? Yeah, Bob's, the, with Bob's camera. Because I recall going, going going down to get to the fishing hole through that. That was the only entrance. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think it's. I think it looks pretty promising. I hope, I hope it works. <laughs> right, so. Thanks, Roger. Yeah. Um, just sort of more of the same. I'm. I just think I'm really excited to see what you come up with next. I just want to know more about. I want to know more about it, and I want to go there. Um, and I, um, the creativity in what you have laid out thus far is very apparent in the, on a lot of different levels, um, as you mentioned. And so I just, you certainly will have <coughs> challenges, I know, moving forward and getting through sort of, you know, meeting the requirements on this, but I just hope that um, the, the team that is working on this <coughs> continues with that vein of creativity and just works on um, finding the best ways to, to meet those requirements in this sort of creative way. So I think it's really, really different from what we normally see. Um, <coughs> and it's exciting, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Is that all for comments on this? Well, we look forward to seeing you come back with some more detail. And thank good, you. Good luck to you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it definitely would. All right. Next item, staff report. All right. So I only have one item on my end. My mic's not on. I only have one item. Um, after receiving feedback from the board at the workshop and via email, um, we will be moving forward with a 6.30 p.m. start time um, starting in June. That's to give us some time to roll it out to the public. Um, and that would also make our end time 10 p.m. <coughs> instead of 10.30. So thanks for uh, replying to our emails. Appreciate it. Uh, administrative amendment report. Do you guys have anything? Uh, for me, this administrative amendment was just the bike storage building um, that was appro administratively approved at the South Village multifamily uh, project down at Eastern Village. Okay. Correspondence? Uh, that was, <clears throat> was a bike storage facility that moved a little bit. Building style was the same, but it shifted a bit on the plan. Um, correspondence. Do we have any planning board correspondence? We have some that were shared here already. <clears throat> okay. Planning board comments. Bravo. Really good job getting through everything. And um, I really like the new um, format of the meeting and the memos. I think it's very straightforward and a job well done, Mr. Chair, and also to staff. Yeah, I, I echo that. Um, the, the the new format of the staff reports was very helpful, so it it worked. Um, assisted in focusing really on, on what was left and what was important. Uh, and Mr. Chair, good job. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'll say staff, excellent job again, as always. You guys are, you guys are rock stars, we all know it. Um, that said, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second, and hey, I'm in favor. There we go, guys. Nice job, guys. Appreciate it.